I've only got two. I've only got two pens inked up right now, Brian. <gasps> I've got my um my my nine twelve, mm -hmm. and I've got a Pilot Parallel that's on my desk. Okay, that's it. That's a that's a different ends of the spectrum there. I know, because I cleaned out my Visconti for that video. Right. Um. So now I've, I'm down to two. Oh wow. Because I'm like, oh, I need to clean something. You and I wanted to you don't have that many and, to choose I, from. and I needed to clean something that we carried. Right. So that was the only thing I had inked up that we currently sell. You could ask me, man. I got all kinds of pens. You've been cleaning. I have been cleaning. I have a bunch at home. You've been a cleaning fool. A bunch at home on my desk that I need to clean, but I just keep leaving them at home You'll get and there. not cleaning them. I believe in you. Like, anyway. like legitimately. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. All right. You ready to do this? I am. I just got ready. All right. All right. Stretch a little bit. Okay. Welcome everybody to episode number 94 of the Goulet Pen Guest, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. I am Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we apparently both got the memo about wearing pastel matchy green big shirts. Yeah, we are matching. Though your shirt is a little louder than mine. What is this? Is, is that a Disney shirt? This is a Walt Disney World shirt. Yes. Yeah, because I see like I've that got, looks like Dumbo. It's that got well. Like, there's a Dumbo ride. These are all the rides and attractions. Yes, I see. I don't see any official trademarked branding. Oh, is you, this like an inspired by no, Disney shirt? No, or is it a genuine? look at the tag. Oh, it's genuine Disney. Okay, genuine. so they're just being subtle about it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, oh, right. I'm nothing right. if not subtle, Brian. <laughs> well, yeah. Drew Subtle Brown is my <laughs> that's, name. That's right. That's what everybody called you, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, what we're going to be talking about is uh, things that we all wish that we knew before buying our first fountain pens. We're going to be... Uh, doing a little different format here. We sourced it out from the community. Yeah. We got their feedback and then we're gonna banter and talk about our feedback and their feedback. It's just like a conversation except very delayed. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, and then uh, let's see what else we did. Da, 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 da. We have a pen to spotlight. We got Tachia Machies. We got two different pens, two different very nice looking Machies to show you. So that's Major always good. Major pens. And we had a long weekend. So I'm sure we have plenty of personal shenanigans to share as well. So. Should be a pretty fun, pretty loose pen cast on this fine June afternoon, morning, whatever. Or maybe you're listening to it after June. I don't know. We're recording it in June. It's so a day. It's a day. It's happening. And it's going to happen first with some feedback. Yes. Um. So last week, Brian, we talked about to remove stickers or to not remove stickers from pilot pens specifically. That yeah, we had some different feelings about this. We did have some different feelings about this. Uh, we had some feelings where I know one or two people said that they leave them on. It's like having a, having a label on a mattress. You just don't remove it forever because it just needs to be there. Um, okay. so, someone said that they appreciate having, if they have multiples of the same pen with different nib sizes, I think you brought that up too, mm -hmm. that it's beneficial to have it, it can labeled. be helpful, yeah. But by far, by far the overwhelming majority was no stickers, get them off. And two people actually quoted me because I think I, I said last week, the sky is blue, coffee is delicious, and take your stickers off. So uh, that, that seemed to resonate with Seems some people. I forgot that I said that, but having it written down, like that is wise. Mm. Seeing it written down when someone else types them like that, that is, yeah. that is a good thing to it's, say. See, as soon as you started, you started out those points so strong, I just tuned out everything you were saying. I was like, there's, uh, there's no, you're not gonna convince me of anything bah, here. Bah, bug. So. <laughs> I'm just All right, and then Crazy Bird Nerd <laughs> says, Canadian here, smoke was definitely the fires in Quebec. We mm. had it pretty bad in Ontario too. Sorry about that. So. It happens. I I don't know if Crazy Bird Nerd is being like uh, ironically Canadian here mm. because like apologizing yes. for it. Yeah, they're known to be very apologetic. Do you think they're being serious about saying I'm sorry for wildfires blowing smoke into your country? Probably. Oh my goodness. Well, Crazy Bird Nerd, it's okay. I'm sorry <laughs> about your country actually burning. Hey, Y'all are the ones on fire. Yeah. So we're we're oh sorry that goodness. happened. Too kind. We didn't do it to you, so we're not sorry in that way. <laughs> not this, not we this are sorry, not this time. <laughs> we're sorry that it happened to you. Yes. Or is happening to you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then Dan says uh, in quotes, um, my quotes, yes, notice me. Think my shirt is cool, but don't talk to me about it. <laughs> Dan says, yes, I'm the same way. Thanks, Drew. I feel so seen. But, you know, see me. Just don't talk about it. 
Mm. So he wants to feel seen, but don't actually see Dan. Okay. Um, what kind of a group or a club would you create of people that I don't know like, like to be seen but not talk to? It would not be a very social group. I don't feel well, like. Well, see, like, <laughs> um, well, here, uh, jo Julian uh, also, re you know, agreed with me here. I totally understand Drew about not wanting people to talk to me about my clothes. Just ignore me or just shortly say something like nice shirt and move on. Mm. I also dress in clothes that are hard to overlook, but I can't help I like them. Just let me be. Um, I feel like there's a, there's a good amount of introverts that like might color their hair very ostentatiously, yeah. but just because they want to, sure. not because they want. They don't want the attention. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's kind of weird. Hmm. Um, I think that I it, there is a certain, you know, uh, immediate reaction to say, well, that person wants to be noticed. But that's definitely not always the case. Now, to be fair, absolutely talk to me. If, if any of you see me, like y'all are cool. Y'all are all on my cool list. So oh, yeah, Drew's please. very approachable. Yes. Yeah. But walking down the street, like, eh, I don't, I don't need anybody talking to me. <coughs> yeah. That's not why the Disney shirt exists. Hmm. Um, the Disney shirt exists because of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Hmm. Now, that. now, if living with the land was on here, though, oh, that'd be good. That would be the winner. That'd be good because we all know I that's like that the ride. best Disney ride. I'm, I'm right there with you. Number one, living with the land. Number two, I think probably uh, the three caballeros. Oh, that's number a good one. Number okay. three, haunted mansion. Actually, no, two is haunted mansion. Mm. Three caballeros is okay. Third. All right, so more of the uh, attraction rides, not the thrill rides. No, I just want to be sitting down. Mm. Moving slowly. Yeah. Being shown things that are happening. Pirates would be number four. Okay. Yeah. These are all, these all fit in the same mm -hmm. category. Mm. Yeah. All right. Live Fair with enough. that land. Spaceship Earth. Fair Spaceship enough. Earth is up there, up there as well. That's a good one too. Yeah. Yeah. Just slowly creep along as things are happening. While I thank the Phoenicians. There you go. All right. Cool. You got more? No. Nope. Oh, you okay. do. Oh, yeah, I got some feedback. Okay, uh, some various Brian autobiography titles. Okay. Yeah, you got yeah. some You got, got some, some alternatives. Got okay. some alts. All right, the Goulet Blues. <laughs> Get it? I like that. Is if you it had a sound sad, sad life. Though. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. I guess if I like, <laughs> na, na, na. If, if tragic things happen to me later in life, I'll write a book called The Goulet Blues. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, the Life of Brian, that. Because Monty Python. I like that. That was a good one. I like that. Always look on the bright the side Brian of life. Side. Yeah. <laughs> wow, you're better at whistling than I am. Thank you. Um, I remember when they did that. I think it was with the London Olympics, maybe. I want to say it felt like Canada, but that doesn't make any sense. Was it Canada? I don't remember which Olympics it was, but they sang that song in the opening ceremonies, and it was glorious because like everybody was singing along because oh, it's wow. a very popular that song. That is cool. Anyway, I like it. Um, because they're British, like it should have been the London Olympics, but I feel like it was Vancouver. I don't know. I didn't look it up. Anyway, okay, uh, what else? That depends. The Pursuit of Nuanced Opinion Making with Brian Goulet. That one's probably my favorite. That's fitting. Yeah. That's fitting. I like to The debate. Pursuit of Nuanced Nuance. Opinion Making. I live in, live in the gray. Yep. Live in the gray. Walk that nuanced line. All right, um, let's see here. Maureen says, Brian and Drew, your autobiography titles were spot on. Your vulnerability and openness with each other was so touching. It's why I watch the pen cast because each week I feel like I'm sitting down with friends and nerding out over pens. That's so do exactly we. what we're shooting for. So do we. So yeah, we're hitting we that We love it. Awesome. Glad glad you feel that way, Maureen. All right, uh, Emperor Le Leiba. There we go. Yes, I'm all... I am all here for Brian's fantasy book. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I would love and to read that. And the wizard did the things. <laughs> and it would totally become a bestseller. <laughs> Please. I would oh, totally read gosh. that. Yes. Yes. Brian's fantasy book where he has never read a fantasy anything. So, yeah. I'll have to add the that to The knight and post. the wizard had yeah. the horse adventure the, writing. The, yes. Times right. with That's dragons. Right. The horse person... <laughs> Came and attacked the village full of villagers. Oh, good. <laughs> and the villagers fled. Ooh, they did. Yes. Oh, gracious. Dramatically. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they went to seek out the oracle. The oracle, yes. yes the, the oracle, oracle could help. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yes, and the oracle mm. said, you have to to find the crystal. No, gotta find the crystal. That has the magic powers. 
because the magic powers of the crystal will fend off the, the horse person invader. Mm -hmm. Does that sound, sound about right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes. It's fun. You're the next Tolkien. It's fun. Yeah, I think I could be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right, this, this last one, we need to do a little bit of a role play, okay? All right, so GV0861 says that I say, mm. safe question, how wet is water? Well, I thought about this question and ended up going down this rabbit hole. What kind of water are we talking about? Are there different types of wetness? How does humidity factor into this? I found a website that discusses the different types of wetness according to over 100 different types of water. And here are my findings. And I'm staring and fiddling with my fountain pen. That's while you talk. <laughs> that's pretty spot on. Uh, I feel like that that's a formula that we could pretty much plug into every yeah, podcast, right? Yeah. And then they say, you know, gosh, I love the rabbit hole talks you guys engage in. Thank you for being you. You're very welcome. You're welcome. Uh, we couldn't be anything else if we tried. Yeah. No. Now, I do try when I do my what's new videos to kind of like just tone things down a little bit because not everybody's here for, a, you know, wildly gesticulating yeah, and talking. loud pen cast. But a few of you had raised concerns about, like, Drew, blink twice if you need help. Because <laughs> I'm trying to just kind of be chill a little bit so that that style of video is more approachable to sure. why. Because it's just about new stuff. You know, we're just talking about new stuff. I don't need to be all booby booby -boo And also trying to curtail my, my personal opinions and just inform. Hmm. Because I don't want to skew anybody. I don't want to yuck anybody's yum. So, um, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm just trying to... Trying to restrain mm. a little bit. You need like a Drew mode, like button or a switch or something where you, when you do want to like really nerd out yeah. over the top. Well, that's, that's just, something. that's my normal, but um, <laughs> yeah. So it's more that you have a, a non-Drew mode for, for Well, I'm style. a pretty calm person unless I'm talking about things that excite me. Then I'm a very, which is not that. Which like 80% of the Which time? is a lot, yeah. <laughs> But when I'm not, I'm, that's I'm, most of the interactions yes, I have with you. That, that, that's my thing. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. At work, I'm usually pretty excited about stuff. So okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Well, that's the feedback we got. Let's uh, talk about some new stuff. All right. I have two pens that we're going to actually show today. These are Tachia pens, the part of the Miyabi Empress. So these are fairly good sized pens. They got sailor nibs on them mm -hmm. that write and look awesome. The big sailor the nibs. The big honking ones. It's like king of pen size, right? Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, this is the Empress because the other one, the, the, there's a smaller version of the Empress called the Empress something, something Empress. It's smaller. Okay. I don't remember what it's called, but the full size Empress, that's the big one, yeah. like these ones. Um, we have Whispering Pond, which is a slightly fancier more elaborate version. And then we have the honeybee and both of these look so good. We'll talk about these more because we're going to show them in detail later in this episode. Um, both of these pens are going to be limited to 20 pieces worldwide. So very limited selection, not uncommon with Machie. Um, and it's to celebrate Tachia's 20th anniversary. So the number 20 was intentional. And yeah, they have the 18 karat uh, king of pens nib. There you go. That we do. And then we've got some new sailors as well. We're carrying both the Pro Gear and the Pro Gear Slim in the Moonlight Over the Ocean. I knew that's what it was called, but I did need to look at it because yes. I want to say moon time over the sunlight. We've or had a lot like that. of things that have names very similar. Moonshine over the sun time. I don't know. That's right. <laughs> um, moonlight Over the Ocean, just like Sunset Over the Ocean. Anyway. Yeah, it's part of the Over the Ocean, yeah. over the ocean series, series, I guess. Yeah. yeah, so we've got Pro Gear, Pro Gear Slim. It's a yellow and an orange. And the orange is a bit of a sparkly um, sort of plastic. So it's a very yeah. pretty pen, very sunsetty um, or moonsetty in this case. I don't know. It looks Just pretend it's a sunset and it looks way better. Um, and yeah. then uh, 260 for the Slim and 360 for the full-size Pro Gear. And those are uh, available now when you're watching this. Also, what might be available now when you're watching this, but we'll get into this more in detail next week, is the Kakemori um, Stainless Steel Dip Nib. That's a new product for us. Um, it's uh, probably going to have been launched by time this publishes, but uh, we don't have one here. And uh, we Yeah, they um, just arrived like they a just couple, couple hours before they, we started filming. They arrived, so they're going to launch. We just don't have a picture we, to show you or anything. Yeah, so. we, need, we need to play with them some we'll, more. We'll, we'll show you next week, but uh, you know, check it out on our website. They're pretty cool. Interesting. Um, all right, that's it for new stuff. All right, we're going to get right into Q&A. Look at this. We're like making like record time in this pen cast. Oh, my God. Well, last week was 2.20, so, you know. Yeah, we definitely we talked a lot. And we might talk a lot in this one. 
So yeah, let's do a Q and A. All, All right. right. So what I did was yeah, you, pose, pose you, a question to the Instagram, Goulet Pens followers. The, the Instagram. The Instagram. Okay. Goulet Pens followers. I was, it was the dot, dot, dot. Okay. And the Instagram Goulet followers. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, the Instagram is. And I said, what's one thing that you wish you knew before you purchased your first fountain pen? Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of great responses. And a lot of the responses were duplicates. So we had a lot of people that had the same thought. Like, I wish I knew this thing mm. um, before I bought my first fountain pen. So I wanted to kind of share some of those um, and uh, we could just talk about them. Like, did do we feel the same way? Do we wish that we would have known this thing? Have we heard this before? Why do we think this is such a common thing that people wish they knew? So we're gonna start off with the first one and by far the most repeated one. We saw so many people say, I wish I knew they were so addictive. I wish I knew how much money I was spending. I wish I knew that this was going to be a rabbit hole. Boom, 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 everywhere. So um, I just picked a random one specifically from just another guy named Jim because I like that name. And Jim just says, I wish I knew just how addictive writing with a fountain pen can be. And I chose this one because he said writing with a fountain pen, not just the, you know, I need to consume more, but just once you go fountain pen, you know, it's hard to go back. Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, what do you think? Do you, do you feel like, uh, you know, once you jump in, it's just kind of grabs you and doesn't let you go? Well, it grabbed me about as hard as it can grab anyone. Well, you didn't like, you know, make a whole, you know, shop that sold fountain pens on the internet I, during a recession or anything crazy like that. I literally like pivoted my whole business because <laughs> I was trying to make wooden pens at the time, mm -hmm. which was a passion of mine. So I just completely just like sunsetted that passion, changed the entire business, and then have been working full time plus in it for fourteen. So you've years been in now. the rabbit hole for quite a while, and you only come up for I air. I don't even know if it's a rabbit hole at this point. It's like you've created quite a network. You're more like deeper. a like a like an ant colony down there. Yeah, yeah, like a fire ant colony. You know, <laughs> just really deep and interconnected with a lot yes. of other things. Yeah, but yeah. I'm I'm living down there. Yes, indeed. Subterranean in this hobby. So I don't know, like. I wonder if people really mean it when they say, I wish I knew how addictive it could be, or they're just saying like, oh my gosh, I had no idea I was going to fall down the right. Like they're saying yeah, it comedically. Yeah. Do they really, really wish they would have known? Or well, is think, it just like tongue-in-cheek? Tongue in so it depends on how literal you take the, like addictive. I think like there's things that are addictive means like you can't stop even though it's bad for you. N talking to other people in the pen world, very few of them have I run into where they're like, have no self-control, they're, mm -hmm. you know, bankrupting themselves because they have a compulsion to buy fountain yeah, pens. Yeah, I don't think it's that I th bad. It's a very lighthearted, I think, Addiction. gesture. Yeah, it's not yeah. an actual like, you know, DSM defined like addiction that you need to seek professional help for. Right. You know, yeah. I think, I think we so. joke about that, but you know, that's not the it, 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 it. There is something that does when you write with a fountain pen and you do, I guess it certain people write with a fountain pen and it's it, it shifts something in their brain and then certain people write with yeah. it, they're like, oh, okay, that's interesting and they move on. But yeah. the people that write with one and realize that it is the way they want to write going forward, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess it is a, it's, it's a more bit like, of a- It's more compelling, I would say. Compelling is Like a they're word. compelled to write with a fountain pen. Yeah. Not that like, they'll have a panic attack if they don't have a fountain pen and have to write with something else. Mm -hmm. It's more just like, oh, it's such an enjoyable experience. I will go out of my way to write with a fountain pen versus something else. I, I definitely fall more into that camp. Yeah. Like ever since I discovered fountain pens, it was very much like, a, oh my gosh, I had no idea that it would feel this different or that, you know, especially once I got into the different nib sizes and ink, you know, colors and personalizing and, you know, having different pens and inks to suit my mood and all that kind of stuff. It was just like, oh, this is so much better of an experience. I like, I basically just never looked back. Yeah. I wish I had had it earlier in my life when I was doing more writing. Oh my gosh. How much more would I have enjoyed school so if I had like more. had these cool pens to like tinker with and, you know, to make the act of writing more enjoyable? That would have helped a lot. A lot. And faster and too. When I was, I was more or less living in on my own when I lived in Raleigh for two years. Mm. And like I wrote a lot for school at that point as well mm. and didn't know a ton of people like that. That would have been such a nice thing for me to have. And mm. then during some of my, you know, unfortunate office jobs. You know, I did a, um, you know, administrative assistant job. I did, you know, a legal job. 
Like those would have been so much more. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, Definitely. I could have yeah. I could have sat there, played with my inks and my pens, and mm -hmm. it would have completely changed stuff. I, yeah. I, it would have really really shifted things. So yeah, I do wish I could go back in time, but. I definitely get like I'm not going to want to, you know, invest any money in a non fountain pen writing experience any longer. Yeah. Like this just makes more sense. Like why not do why not write in a way that is more enjoyable? So yeah, I, I totally get that. I just I wonder you have you found that there's a certain type of person that's a little pre wired to kind of being bit by the bug, like having that first writing experience and then oh, being yeah. like, okay, this is what I'm gonna be doing from from here on out. Do you think that person always needs to be a person that previously has had kind of like, have has been particular about their writing instruments? It's a good question. I don't have like any firm data to speak on. Because every, everybody that I have spoken to about their fountain pen, you know, origin, they always start with kind of the same thing. We're like, well, when I was in you know mm. school, I was really particular about the type of pen. I, I really like this one type of pilot pen, or I wanted I like mm. this one gel pen. And when I first got my when I got for my first roller ball, when I first had a ballpoint, it was like wow. And they seem to have from an earlier age figured out like I like this type of notebook. I like this type of pen. It's just like an intentionality around yeah. the, the products they use. Yeah, I, I think that it's not like an exclusive thing. Like if you don't have that, you wouldn't be into fountain pens. But I think like definitely there's a lot of people like if you were very specific about the notebook or pen or pencil or whatever writing instruments you had, especially growing up, like I think you naturally have more of the inclination to appreciate something that is as nuanced as fountain pens. That's yeah. probably more what I would say. I'd see, it seems common from what I've heard, but yeah, um, I, was, I was never um, super into that, like I, when I got a good pen that I liked, you know, like a uniball, some rollerball or something like that, mm. I held on to that thing for as long as I could. I'm like, do not lose this, <laughs> do not lose this. So like, I knew what I liked and I mm. knew the value of a good pen, you know, or better than just kind of whatever disposable crap. But uh, I never actually asked my mom like, hey, can you buy this specific pen for me for school mm. or anything like that? Okay. Uh, did you ever do that? I had specific, yeah. I, was, I had specific taste. I had like a Dr. Grip mechanical right. pencil. Did you request that? I don't remember how I came across that, yeah. to be honest with you. Because I don't remember ever telling my mom like, hey, I want this particular pen or actually going to a store and buying a particular pen for school. Hmm. But, but I, when, I, I, I liked the Pilot Precise like V5. Those I really liked a lot. It's a rollerball pen, but it uses liquid ink like a fountain mm -hmm. pen. So it's very smooth writing. It's very precise kind of a tip. Um, I remember that is like what I wanted to use as far as pens go. So I, I think I naturally had more of an inclination to use like smoother writing, better, yeah. like wetter writing instruments. I just literally had never been exposed to the use of a fountain pen before. So for me, for me, it was like, I was like ripe for it. Yeah. You know, and I think there's definitely some people like that, but there's other people that, you know, maybe aren't as intentional about it, but then you know, they kind of get won over in other ways and mm -hmm. they, you know, see the appeal of it over time and stuff like that. I also wonder if everybody who said, I wish I knew just how, you know, addictive fountain pens could be. I wonder if the majority of them already had a hobby of some kind, mm. because I find it hard to believe, not doubting y'all, but I find it hard to believe that you just stumbled into fountain pens without any other hobby mm. and was like, oh my gosh, this is like a hobby of mine. I bet you had something else going on that would have, well, so this is where, like, it depends. Are you talking, like, collecting fountain pens? Like, getting a whole bunch of different pens and being really into them as, you know, collectible objects or actually writing with them? They, we'd not, gotta, that it, not that it's mutually exclusive. We got a, we got a mix of both when, when yeah. they answered. Like, I think like, that, you know, another guy named Jim here is talking about addictive in terms of writing. But I yeah. think a lot of people were also saying, like, how much money I'd lose, how much money I'd spend. So, like, there sure, was a lot yeah. of comments so about the collecting. That's more about the well, collecting the kind of thing. Yeah. Like, my, my mother-in-law, my sister, they both have a couple of pens, and they kind of found a pen that they really liked, and they just use that. They're not into it. They don't follow it. They just, they really love the pen or the couple of pens that they have, and that's their writing experience, and they see the need to look no further. Yeah. Even though they know that they could get anything in the world basically through me, they just, you know, it's they've they've solved the need that they had. And, you know, my mother-in-law, it's like she's got like wrist issues and stuff like that. So like the fountain pen is better for her to be able to write without 
you know, having to like cramp her hand and stuff like that. And the Pilot Varsity is her pen. I buy her seven packs of the mixed colors of Varsities and just, I keep feeding them to her as she needs them. It's Those with pen. like a Clairefontaine notebook, it's everything she wants. She literally doesn't want to hear of anything else. She's got what she needs and she's happy with that. My I sister, wonder if you know, I would be that way if I didn't work here. It's a good question. I don't know. Yeah. What Cause, would cause we be like? In because the... I'm like that way with watches and knives. I've got my three mm. and I've got my three. And yeah. Then, so I, I do wonder if I would have just I think like, that's okay. And I already only ink up three. So I, I wonder mm -hmm. because I have found some pens and I'm just like, this is all I need. Like when I mm. finally got, you know, my E95S and when I finally got my Stargazer and my 912, I like Pilot. Um, I was like, you know what? This is good. This is the only, but then I also feel that way with, the next new thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe I wouldn't. Cause I, every time I get one, I'm like, oh, this is the, this is all I need. If I could just have one pen, it'd be this one. You know what? If I could just have one pen, it'd be this one over here. Ah, this one that I just got, this is the one. So, so well, I think, I think the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. So how many interests and hobbies have you had where you get one or two or three, you find something that's good and then you just stick with it and then move on. Hmm. Is that common? Or is it more like something you're not as passionate about and you will get into it in as I, I, much to solve your problem and then you just like, all right, good, I'm I ready think, to move I on I think fountain else. pens fall closer in with knives and watches mm. than they do with coins, comic books, and retro games because those are collections. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have, you know, a bunch of those. Yeah. Um. But uh, the pen is closer to a usable tool mm -hmm, like that just mm -hmm. kind of gets the job done sure. like watches and knives so i probably have fewer of those mm. um but i probably keep on coming back and picking up one every now and then well like even when you brought out your collection last week you know given how long you've worked here and how much access you have to pens you have a i would say a fairly conservative collection yeah. it's about, i think it's like 40 pens or something like that that's but i think very reasonable there are know? people that i know have been um in the interest and in hobby for like just you know two three years and have more than forty pens. I think it took me about a month to get to forty pens. Oh my god! Back in the day, granted they were much cheaper pens, but I am like full stop. Yeah, I will like take pretty much any pen. Like I I have duplicates of certain pens and stuff like that that I don't want to let go. Like mm. I, it's a it's a little more emotionally connected for me, probably because it's like the business and the whole. You but know. you also don't like getting rid of things. Uh, it's it's more of a tendency. I'm I'm a little more of a. Not a hoarder. No, you're not a hoarder. Because I'm an acquirer. You're not wanting to get aggressive rid of acquirer. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just like to have options. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and like whatever it is that I'm into, I tend to get pretty into mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and I also don't. I'm not the most organized. I am very organized with my pens, mm -hmm. but with most other things, I'm not as organized. So I will misplace and lose things and buy duplicates of things, ah. and then I'll finally go through and organize me. But like, oh, I have like five of the same hammer because I keep rebuying it or something like that. Or I loan it out and I forget I loaned it out. So I buy it again. And you know, that happens with the stuff that I'm into. Yeah. You know, not in an unhealthy way, but just, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm on it, man. I'm just like, I'm multi -pack, making multi things happen. Multi-pack of sunglasses kind I of guy. Buy, I buy, yeah, I buy sunglasses. I'm not buying multi-packs of sunglasses anymore. They have these sunglasses that are like $5 at the checkout at Home Depot. <laughs> so I just buy those. <laughs> But I'll, I'll I'll grab a few at a time for sure, because like they're they're durable enough. They'll last me six months or so. But you know, if I'm mowing the lawn and I'm yeah. throwing them, I'm, I drop them and run them over. I'm like, oh well, okay, it's five dollars. You know, it's yep. fine. Move on with my life. Nice. Speaking of moving on, do you well, want to? Uh, let's do the next read question, this shall we? Second one, yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So this one we got several different pieces of feedback here. Oh, this um, is another popular one. Yeah. We got Nighthawk that says how quickly I would abandon ink cartridges and transition to bottled ink converters. Um, kind of along the same line, uh, Denev Carranza says that converters existed and Anira said converters are a thing. So kind of the like getting away from cartridges, moving towards converters, bottled ink, et cetera. So what do you think about this, Drew? Yeah, this, this like? one surprised me. Like yeah? the, the how addictive they can be. Like I saw that one coming. That's yeah. a pretty common thing. But yeah. This one about how like um, like someone not knowing that a cartridge existed, um, I was like, oh, really? Because or that a converter existed? Co converter, yeah. So they're just using cartridges. Yeah, or like yeah. 
just, you know, that converters are existed, converters are even a thing. Um, hmm. So that makes me wonder like, A, is there something we could be doing as people who work for a fountain pen company to make sure that people out there know that converters are a thing? Um, I feel like we prom promote I, that pretty I heavily, know, right? You know? Like, and like, so I just I wonder if maybe these are folks that come to the kind of hobby zone, aka a podcast about fountain pens, um, from just kind of a user of what was available at random stores. So like if you yeah. wanted to go, if you went to like Five Below and you grabbed, you know, a pack of like Lamy Safari knockoffs or whatever they have over there, mm -hmm. they're not going to come with a converter usually. Right. They're probably going to yeah. have just some, you know, cartridge. So um, I guess, you know, you could just grab something at a craft store or hobby shop that is a pretty, yeah. you know, run of the mill fountain pen with just a cartridge and kind of enter yeah. the hobby that way. Or like I think in most instructional type settings like schools and things like that, cartridges are more of the standard. Yeah, especially if, you know, we're talking you know. outside of the US. Yeah, so I think that that would make sense that more people would be exposed to cartridges first uh, and then, you know, kind of rediscover, you know, like just kind of out of utility of using fountain pens. Okay, this is what we're using and there's cartridges. So that's kind of how it's done. And then actually discovering this is like, oh, there's like a whole following. There's a whole community around these products. And, it, you know, how often do we hear about that? And people are like, oh, I've only ever used blue and black ink. I had no idea there were so many color options now. Yeah, it's because they were exposed to it in school or whatever. And they just, you know, had their job and they didn't really look beyond that. And now realizing, oh, it's really expanded quite a bit. I feel like the the rise of ink color availability that kind of coincides when, when, with when we, you know, online and when we started getting into this and just the ease and availability for boutique ink companies to make really interesting ink colors. I feel like that has probably drastically expanded the like desire for using bottled ink, I would, I would have to say. Yeah. And it's weird. I've seen, you know, when I was a kid and I'd see like fountain pens and cartoons and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I thought every fountain pen. Yeah. It's always filled, bottled. Yeah. Filled by itself. You know, because they always depict like the old fountain like, pens like that, filler that the cartoon type, character yeah. can squirt in someone's eye, right? right? Yeah. Like they actually like just use a lever and just like eject it as though it's some yeah. sort of super soaker water gun. And uh, oh, I mean, like my my dad has told me like he used fountain pens in school and they totally did that. They use them like squirt guns, which is probably why a lot of schools got away from using with, bottled with ink. ink or water with ink. Oh my god! Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yikes. Well, he was, he was he had some wilder times in yeah. his younger days. Oh my god! Um, but yeah, it was not on. Not, I mean, you figure you give a classroom full of kids, you know, fountain pens, or bottled ink, and ink's yeah. gonna get places. Yikes! You know, so. I never knew. I've never actually tried to like you know get any distance with uh with one of those. I don't know. Uh, my my father in law says that what they used to do is take and flick them. You yeah. Know, so just kind of take and flick and it just gets some out of the feed. I know that's, I know that's good easy. leverage. Oh yeah, I know yeah, that's and easy. Plus you can kind of flick and then you can just like go discreetly back to like doing it so nobody oh, knows who yeah. did you it. You know, that that's one of my main tests for finding out if my pen has all of the ink out of it. I'll take a paper mm. towel and I'll just like really, you know, forcefully flick it and see what sprays up against the um, towel. It's risky. Um, what if you lose your grip and fling that thing across the room? Hasn't happened yet. But um, Oof, you're a braver man than I. Well, you can just touch the nib of the paper towel, and it'll no. But like tell. when you, but you're you're when you're forcing it, you get stuff from like back there. Like you really bring everything to the front. Yeah. Like I can touch it and not get anything, but then it's I like, flick it's like it. Like hawking up phlegm. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like that oh God, Brian. Yeah. Um, wow. I'm trying to think of what else. I'll touch you, it you know. to the paper, the the paper towel, and not get anything. But then I'll flick it, and I'm like, oh no, nope, there's some, some stuff in there. Really? Yeah. I haven't tried flinging it. Now, please don't leave me responsible. Don't for do this you. technique. This is a terrible technique. <laughs> it's not terrible. This is just Drew's it's thing. It's very effective. Yeah. Um, this is officially but... not recommended for you to try <laughs> it. Uh, but whatever. If you look up to Drew and want to model his example, then mm. well, shame, got... on, shame on you. You're going to have a lot <laughs> of hard bigger problems. You're going to have a lot of hard lessons to learn in your life. <laughs> But, you know, it's it's weird because I can't relate to this one because I have always known that converters were a thing. You know, the first pen I had was in 2011 when I got the All-Star. Um, mm. And you were like, you were hey. You were working here. Yeah. You need to learn about fountain pens. Here's what a converter is. So I was like, I just can't imagine someone not knowing about a converter. Yeah, you, you had an atypical introduction Very to the atypical, fountain pen experience. Yeah. But I don't, the weird thing is, I don't, like most of the people that I know learned about fountain pens starting to work here. So yeah, um, yeah. I guess I need to talk to more people about uh, different origin stories. I just always... I think a lot, of it, a lot of it has to do with what you're exposed to 
you know, earlier on. Yeah, because it might be, you know, a uh, a time period thing. Like, when did you get into fountain pens too? Right. Because if you got into fountain pens anytime within the last like 20 years, I'd say converters are coming with a lot of pens, pretty much. Especially you know, in the US, yeah. Yeah, pretty much anything over $50 uh, has a converter in yeah, it. Yeah, most often, yeah. Um, so, you know, even steel nibs, everything. So, well, there's a time when we barely carried any cartridges because it was really all about the bottled ink. For yeah. Us. If anything, I would say that cartridges have become more popular, which is weird. Because I don't know if it's more popular. We're selling think, more of them. I think we we are selling more than we used to. It's a bottled ink still way outsells oh, cartridges. Of course. I think there are some cartridges that are more, or sorry, there are some inks that are more available in cartridges that didn't mm. used to be. Think uh, about like Hiroshizuku mm. and, you know, Dymine and various other things. Um, but uh, I've yeah, started, I've to, actually started to like cartridges more as I've gone along. Really? I used to hate them. But uh, now to your know. point though, a lot of that has had to do with the availability. With the availability yeah. yeah. It was like the, 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 you know, more, I'll call, I'll call them plain colors mm-hmm. that you would get like, from the standard line of whatever Pelican, pen company. Kaveco. Yeah, and so it was like, the colors were fine, yeah. but when you're used to using, you know, Emerald de Chavour. It was really when, these other when, crazy when Diamine started and, really coming out with all of their normal colors in cartridge form. I feel like that's yeah. when it's really started picking up because they have a massive library. Yeah, and Private Reserve back in the day, they had pretty saturated colors. They, you know, they had some more of the more interesting colors um, years, mm-hmm. years ago. And now their colors are still interesting, but they're, they were more kind of pushing the front, kind of like pushing the envelope, I guess, in terms of colors and saturation and stuff like that back mm-hmm. in the 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. I'm curious, to, like, let us know if you, when you got into the hobby, if you did not know about converters. That that That's interesting to me. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of an atypical situation too, because I, I got into fountain pens because I was a pen maker making kit pens that would come with a couple of stock cartridges and come with a converter. And so I sort of discovered both at the same time, but the first thing I ever actually inked up and used was bottled ink. So even though I had cartridges, I didn't puncture it. I didn't actually try to write with it. I used bottled ink um, because I had like already been on forums and looking all that, you know, so I kind of, I kind of was researching and getting a little more into it that way first. So I think, I don't know, I, I'm curious. I'm curious ex- ex- exactly what most people experience there, yeah. but that's cool. Um, another very popular one that I thought was not only a popular answer, but a very good answer, mm. um, came from, uh, Emily Lai, our Wee, and RVA girl. Uh, so Emily says that price doesn't guarantee how smooth or nice a pen writes. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, RP says cheap pens can also be good writers. And RVA girl says, that pens don't have to be that expensive. All three of these people mm. men- are mentioning the theme of how they wish they had known that price going up does not, you know, is not a one to one ratio of mm. quality going up. Yeah, and I love that because I think that that is such a misconception about fountain pens is that mm. you need to spend a lot of money to enjoy it, um, mm-hmm. and that if you do spend an, a lot of money, that doesn't equal you know, an equivalent in quality. Right, especially writing quality. You know, you're gonna get a lot of other nice things the more money you spend on a pen. But, you know, the law, there's a very steep law of diminishing returns, especially when it comes to writing quality, Um, especially today. I will say it was different back in the day, you know, like way back when, talking decades ago, steel nib, like the alloy of steel was not as good. There definitely was more, machines, not as much handwork, like that type of stuff. There was a pretty big difference between steel nibs and gold nibs. Gold nibs is where it was pretty much the standard. Gold was a lot cheaper too. So it was pretty much like uh, most of the effort went into the gold nibs and the, the steel nib pens were like really the the mass produced cheaper pens. Yeah. Um, so it was, there was more of a difference. Uh, you know, fountain pens are around for 150 years. so you kind of got to look at some things on a like a longer timeline, you know, especially if it's, you got people who have used pens since the fifties or sixties or whatever, you know, who might be on some forums and contributing some of the conversation out there in the community. You know, some of that might be like how they experienced it when they got into pens and some things just kind of get recycled and, you know, told, you know, like the difference between steel and gold. I feel like that has really narrowed quite a bit 
you know, there's not as much of a difference now in terms of quality as what even before, you know, we when we first got into it, yeah. you know, there were good inexpensive pens, but I feel like now it's even more ubiquitous. Um, yeah, even the, ga just the gap at, in quality is narrowing. Yeah, even just looking at a company like Yovo, it's like how many more pens have Yovo steel nibs now than what they used to be, you know, oh, man. 10, you 12 only, years ago. Only Edison that we had. Yeah, and they were they were the you know one of the one of the first to really have them uh, here in the U.S. and and it's a lot more available and you know so I think it's uh, I think it's good to to not assume and also just like fountain pens for a while I feel like especially in like the '90s and early 2000s there was a lot of limited editions and you had like Mont Blanc and these other brands that were like more kind of pushing them as a status symbol cross yeah which kind of fed into the you know you have to spend a lot of money to have a nice pen kind of a thing but then i think that that's really changed in the last decade or so yeah. there have been so many more like really good inexpensive pens even from big companies like pilot coming out yeah, with well, like, the metropolitan well you just mentioned the, the varsity like yeah varsity. You, you can yeah. enjoy a fountain pen experience using Absolutely. a varsity like yeah. it is a pleasant writing experience for sure for sure so and yeah that's less than five dollars yeah it's it's you know it's sort of like i don't know if you buy clothing like if you buy a pair of jeans like you don't have to spend a lot of money to get a very good wearable pair of jeans if you do spend a lot of money there are going to be some things that maybe you like more maybe somebody who's not as into jeans would not even really be able to tell the difference. You know, it's it's kind of like that. It's like it's like anything else, really. The more money you spend, the usually it's just the more specific you get about your the nuances of the product and what it has. And, and if what, you're into what it's that, made then, of, where it's made, yeah, what the it, theming what's, of it, what's used, the rarity, in its manufacturing. yeah, the rarity of the material, stuff like that. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be into it. So, yeah. No, and I think that's very good. I think that um, <clears throat> one reason, a reason that a lot of folks uh, tend to be disappointed with their grail pens, you know, stuff that they've saved up for mm -hmm. so long for and, you know, spent hundreds of dollars on mm -hmm. when that pen performs on paper the same way, sometimes not the same way, even worse than, mm -hmm. you know, something that they paid, you know, $300 for mm -hmm. rather than $800. It's 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 tough to kind of consolidate that and mm. reconcile that and say why, why is this the case you know and even if even if you know that okay this eight hundred dollar pen the eight hundred dollar pen that I bought that I saved up for you know years for is expensive because it's made of you know celluloid or something like that yeah like it's still in your mind you think it should write like eight hundred dollars worth better yeah, like three times better than the 300 dollars pen or whatever yeah that but like this yeah. this this one i think is one of the answers um question three here yeah. uh, or answer three one of the best ones that i do wish mm -hmm. before anybody bought their first fountain pens i i would put out there to to, to, to gift everybody this realization yeah, start um, with obviously price. knowing a converter exists it is definitely I would let them know that too you but can this, get cheap pens with converters but this one is a really good one I, if I picked between all five of our talking points today mm. this one might be my top one that I'd like to just snap my fingers and have everybody who is about to purchase their fountain mm. pen you know to know I think it's just a really good thing to keep in mind and I think it's a good way to allow people to just be happy with what they have mm. and to know that this this can be good enough if this is what you got and I, I think that that's really the whole point of this is just to enjoy your writing experience. And you can do that in a wild variety of ways. Mm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that uh, what's your favorite, like, super affordable pen? Oh, gosh, I have a lot of them. If you wanted to go, like, you know, less than $20. I mean... Honestly, Platinum Preppy is still pretty solid. That's Platinum Preppy is solid. It's a good, very affordable I, I, pen I, for... I don't love writing with the Preppy. I don't like holding the Preppy. It's very light. But like but the Preppy and the uh, Varsity, as far as staying ready to write, yeah, I they, they beat it's out... Tough to be, they beat tough out to be. even, you know, some of the... You know, they beat out the Metropolitan... Well, Metropolitan is not a, under, under $20, is it? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. It was a while um, ago, but but uh, I do like the Metropolitan a lot. Yeah, I think that um, yeah, those those are exceptional. They really yeah. are. I love the pile of Varsity too. Like Varsity's our, talking about that. It's already preloaded with ink, especially if you're just getting into it and you're like, I don't know about these fountain pens. Mm -hmm. 
Just try it. Like, that's a really good one to try out. It is. I'm a big fan of the Kakuno, the Pilot Kakuno. That's I, I like too. that one because you, yeah. get, you get that. It's like $14. It does not come mm. with a converter. So that's a bit of a bummer. But I mean, what? You're talking under $20. You're probably not going to get that. Yeah. Um, but you've got the same nib and feed as you do on Pilot Steel nibs upwards of, you know, around $60. So mm -hmm. I think that the Kakuno is a great deal. I just, I don't love the way it feels in my hand either. Like, really? It's just kind of awkward and chunky, you know. It's not. Yeah, interesting. Nothing streamlined about it. No, um, it's not what it's for. No. Yeah. Um, same thing with the Go. The Go is less than twenty dollars, so mm. you know you could put the Twisby Go in there. But again, chunky, clunky, you know. Yeah. Weird little. I don't know. <laughs> it's just like a it's, lumpy. It kind of falls into its own category. <laughs> yeah, they're it's all kind of like yeah. But I will say, like the the, the pens that we sell that are less than twenty dollars, like I would vouch for any of them. Yeah, pretty They're much. They're all solid. The Magnum, I think, is under 20, isn't it? Magnum or is it right, 24? It's right there. It's right there. It be. Either way. Yeah, yeah 100%. So uh, everybody yeah. that mentioned this, I think, uh, makes some really good points. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Mary Ann's Book Life says, The difference between Japanese and Western nibs, as well as wiser thoughts, that European pens suit cursive writing more than their Japanese counterparts, in my personal opinion. I and like this. So cat, we, cat mechanic is, uh, well, as well, Japanese nibs especially oh, yeah. for extra fine so similar theme to most of these so we've got three people that mentioned uh, that mm -hmm. they wish that they knew the difference between a japanese and a western nib mm. on this one and a me brian i i don't really uh i don't notice that a whole lot really so the way i have like i just i forget when I'm writing and comparing that mm. where where pens are from. I just I just mm. I don't think about about it a lot. I know that this nib is different than this nib. Mm. This one runs wider than this one, but I it's not like that line of delineation is so obvious to me. Mm -hmm. Uh and maybe it's just that I'm not registering it in my brain, but mm. like I, if I write with a medium nib, Japanese or European I, I, I kind of just feel like it's a medium nib, you know, I'm not, mm -hmm. but I might just be less attentive than most people. And I've been told that pretty much all my life. So well, maybe. So this is, this is one that I think does need a little bit of nuance. Well, let's nuance it, Brian. So this is something that I, if you can do that, I don't heard. know. Do you think you well, can? Well, so yeah. <laughs> Can I go? Can I go into deep dive? I don't have a web. I don't have a website to reference. Can you do I might be able to pull something out. Um, this is something that I heard about a lot when I first got into the hobby. Um, largely, it was it was talked about in terms of extra fines. Like, oh, the extra fine on Japanese is either so much finer, yeah, so much smoother, I, I so much think better. That, that's pretty cetera. well understood. But then, you know, kind of like Marianne's book life here. N nothing, nothing saying specific about Mary here. But this is the kind of thing like. There's a huge difference between Japanese and Western nibs. It's it's more nuanced. It's more specific than that. So I hear a lot of people, and I did this myself for a long time because I didn't really know that much. I was just like, oh yeah, Japanese nibs run finer. Some do, some don't. You can't just say across the board. Yeah. So really, when we're talking about Japanese nibs, we're talking about Platinum, Sailor, and Pilot. I don't know if there are other companies out there making their own nibs. I'm not sure. Uh, from Japan, um, but those are the big three, and those mm -hmm. are the ones that we carry and that we know. Um, so those are one, and then Western is like kind of anything come out of Europe, mainly Germany. Uh, they come out with a lot of nibs, but Italian kind of goes in there mm -hmm. too. Um, but definitely like German nibs, really like that's a huge nib producer, and and a lot of them do feel different. And I think some of it does have to do with um, the the way that you write, like Wiser Thoughts said. Um, you know, European pens, European pens suiting cursive writing. I wouldn't necessarily say cursive, just more like long form writing as opposed to like, you know, kanji script like you would have, you know, in Japan. Um, you know, shorter strokes, needing to be very precise, having some line width, so maybe some softer nibs or things like that um, might make more sense with that script. Whereas, you know, with whatever language that it may be, most Western languages is more like, you know, it, it might be cursive, so you might have longer connected, but even just our letters are longer and flowier than script, right? Yeah, so more, more curves than the con than like uh, characters. Yeah. Uh, so I think that right there probably it would have to inform like how those nibs are made, right? Yeah. Um, but the 
the biggest kind of nuance that uh, took me a while to kind of discover and figure out, like I'm talking like years, even being in the industry, I always thought like, oh, Japanese and Western nibs. And I was like, well, it's not nice. It was kind of like you. It was like, well, you know, I'm using a vanishing point medium and it doesn't really seem any different than yeah. a, a Lamy medium. Like, what's the difference? What I've come to find by carrying all the major brands and by by having a wider availability of nib sizes than I feel like there used to be when we got into this over a decade ago, Japanese, it's more of a standard to have a medium fine or a fine medium. It's an extra nib size in there. Mm -hmm. So mediums and broads and to a degree stubs, Japanese and Western are pretty similar. Like there, there's going to be variances, you know, a little bit from pen to pen and brand to brand, you know, but largely you're kind of working within the same tolerances more or less. But there's a bigger difference when you get to fine and extra fine. Yeah. And then certainly double extra fine or whatever. Those are more specialty. Extra fine for sure. Like that, really, that is one that I 100% noticed. It's fine and extra fine that are the biggest difference. And a lot of that reason is because basically all three of the big Japanese companies have a medium fine stuck in there. And the medium fine is sort of in between a Western fine and a medium. So it's not quite as fine as a Western fine, but it's probably closer to that than a medium. And then because of that, the Japanese fine nib is then finer. So it's like kind of in between a European extra fine and a fine, but maybe a little closer to extra fine. And then the Japanese extra fine is finer than the European extra mm. fine. So because you have a whole extra nib size basically kind of shoved in there and it you know essentially pushes finer, those extra fine and fine nibs, that's actually why. And I don't know, you know the whole history of those nib sizes yeah. and how they came about. Um, but that's what I've seen from all three brands, uh, Pilot, Platinum, and Sailor. That makes a lot of sense. And, and it's and they're pretty consistent across the Japanese brands because they have that medium fine in there. And now that we have medium fines on more pens, I'm like, oh. Makes sense. This is why. It's not that like across the board, all Japanese nibs are ground finer. That is not the case in my experience. The mediums and broads and above are the same as the Western. You just have a medium fine in there that kind of shoves the others down. So it's kind of like um, like in in uh, certain sports where they have weight classes. If mm -hmm. you've got one, like say boxing has five weight classes. Yeah. You know, so if you're in your if you're 170 pounds, you're in this weight class. If you're 185, you're in this weight class. But then say you know jujitsu has only three weight classes. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be. The, those three are going to cover a wider, right. you know, chunk of weights than yeah. the other weight classes where they're going to be more specific. So what is, you know, middle weight in one and middle weight in the other, they're going to be two completely different weights Yeah, because you just have more of them over there. I think that's, that's pretty, that's pretty much what I'm saying. Huh. It's kind of like that. I did not know that. I never had, a, I never had that explained to me when I first got into this. I just heard and read online and stuff like that. It makes like, sense. Japanese is finer than Western. Right. And I was like, oh, and I just assumed it was across the board. And then I was like, well, it's just- But why quite, though? Yeah, yeah, but why? And again, I don't know who started it and how far it goes back, but it goes back further than anything I've ever experienced, mm -hmm. which is, you know, maybe not that long, but that's from what I understand, like that's how it's been for quite some time. Yeah. So I don't but know no, the there, origins there, of that, but- There definitely is a, uh, an extra, you know, huge difference in extra fine that is noticeable, I think, you know, by just about anybody, but- I really have fall, fallen in love with Japanese extra fines. I really, really love fine, fine, fine Japanese nibs. I just mm -hmm. love that it takes time and effort to get those ground down and you know uh, tuned in such a way that they are effective and comfortable to write with. I just think that those are very like indicative of the craftsmanship and the time uh, spent creating these pens. So I really do love those, but. Uh, I'm totally fine writing with a broad as well. And I do appreciate the consistency of, you know, having medium broads pretty much wherever um, you kind of know what you're going to get. But uh, that said, I have had some surprise, um, uh, uh, you know, um, maybe not. Uh, I've had some surprise German extra fines, not Italian. I've okay. never I've never had an Italian nib surprise me by how extra fine it was. Okay. But every now and then I'll, I'll find like a Yovo EF nib that's like okay that's that, that's all, that's pretty fine but there those also can be a little inconsistent as well you know you mm. you go through you know twenty nibs you might find one in twenty that's like a little more fine but that that's that's nice when when you do find it 
you have anything else uh, you want to Yeah, add? I was looking because I've looked at Richard Bender's site and he had a pretty good reference chart somewhere. I'm having a hard time finding it, but he basically had like taken measurements of the point size, like the tipping sizes. Um, and it did break out, you know, it kind of showed more visually somewhat of what I was describing with the different nib sizes. I'm, I'm looking on his site and I can't find exactly where it is. Do you want to add that to if the, I can, uh, if show I can, notes? yeah, if I can find it, I will try to do that. But it basically, it gives a breakdown of, um, of the actual measurements. And then you can see like, oh, it's, you know, it's very small, small differences, but it's like, you know, the Western, I'm just pulling these numbers off the top of my head. The Western, you know, fine might be a 0.35 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the Japanese fine might be a 0.3 or something like that. And then the extra fine might be like 0.2 or 0.23 or something. How amazing and, would it be to have like some sort of nib inspector going around all of these factories with that chart mm. and making sure that every medium was the same width, every extra fine was the same width, and you would just always know I mean, what you're getting every time you buy. Oh. So what's tough is like, these are such small tolerances. You're literally talking like tenths or hundredths of a millimeter. That's mm. really, really small. Even if you weld on a tipping that's a 0.3 milli millimeter, by the time you cut the slit and then you do the shaping and stuff by hand, just the variance of how long you have it. I mean, having yeah. it a couple extra seconds and grinding can change the shape of it a noticeable enough amount by the time you put ink to paper. So, so what you're saying is you won't pay me to go around being well, an it's inspector just not, wearing a funny hat. It's just not as easy to standardize as you would probably think. Because I wanted one of those hats that's like the really tall hat like you'd see on like an old school like Christmas marching man, you know, okay. with the... But rather than like that big plume right up the front, it would just be a big nib. Wow. I've got it all planned out and you just crush my dreams. There, I, I'm trying to think if there's it's a It's going to be an international nib hat. inspector. And I wouldn't have to do anything because I have a tool. And why, I'd would just you, be like, why would you need a big hat? And, and I'd put, <laughs> why would I need to assert authority, Brian? With a big hat? Big hats are the best way to assert authority. Everybody knows that. The best way? The bigger the hat, the more imposing the individual, for sure. It, it's like it's like making yourself big when you see a bear. Like, ah! And the bear's so like, oh my God, look at that hat. You just I'm have a very large hat that getting uh, out of here. asserts yeah, authority? absolutely. I you know, guess, have you seen, yeah. you like the Sultan in Aladdin, you know? Mm. That's a big hat. He you does know, have a big hat. He's, he's a diminutive gentleman, you know, and he's kind of a goofball. But that hat, you're like, hey, all right, Sultan. I, you, you got it, buddy. Jaf I, I, Jafar's got a pretty intimidating hat as well he does especially when he goes into like sultan mode that's what i'm saying that man hat, that hat gets pretty it's an imposing piece of yeah. head headdress interesting so yeah if i'm gonna travel across the globe if i'm gonna globe trot and nib inspect i need some sort of uh authoritarian headwear you've clearly thought about this more than i have <laughs> i'm thinking about it right now it's all coming yeah. together Oh, man. Oh, wait, no. Nope, nope, not quite. I, right. keep, I keep trying to find this chart and I'm not finding it. All right, well, if anyway. he finds it, we will add it in for you. Um, at least one person last week said that, hey, I appreciate Brian linking to that uh, article about something. So they oh, so at least yeah. one person read your last one. That's good. The, the Rice article. Oh. About Rice. Yeah, Rice University. Yes. The, the, yeah, that was a definitely a deep dive. That one, yeah. The, so some, at least one person read the, it. The hit the the origins of color. <laughs> yeah, it's like that was a that was a plunge down the rabbit hole on that. There one. is always at least one person that appreciates your deep dives in wow. the comments. That's who so I do it for. You're that one you're, person. You're not alone. That one person who's tracking with me out there. It's oh, a, I'm sure there's more. probably a different person every time, but anyway. That's fun. All right. Um, last question. So this one is, you know, not not a question, but our last talking point, you know, comes from the comment Brian mentioned from Do On A Gun. Uh, paper plus pen plus ink is a combination that gives the writing experience, not just the pen. And then EKPS Photos says pen plus ink plus paper. Not every combination works and that's okay. Keep experimenting. Oh man, maybe, maybe I want this one to go out to everybody instead. Mm. It's tough, because this is another good one. This like, is a big one. This, this last one, like, it's okay if it doesn't work, keep experimenting. That's it's so pens, right, pens, right? Pens get all the attention, right? Yeah. But ink and paper, I mean, ink gets attention because it's very visual and especially with how available different inks are, you know, it's a much more attainable way to vary up your writing experience. Paper, I feel like, just gets overlooked so much. 
so yeah. much. And, you know, it's it's hard too because paper is like all the terminology is weird and not anything we're familiar with. You know, ink and pens, like they use some of the same terminology like flow and whatever, dry time and like various things like that, I guess. Yeah. Um, you know, that's all things like the ink associated with the pen more or less. The paper, I feel like, is, is definitely the afterthought. So yeah, um, well, but all you know three what? come not, into play. Not everybody gets a choice of what paper to use. It is, so it is the hardest thing. Factor, it is yeah. the hardest thing to like control. Yeah, control. Yeah. You right there? I was gonna sneeze, but I crushed it with my mind vice. There you go. Nice. Well done. Yeah. We don't have a we don't yeah. have a, a, a mute button. You know, so no, nope, I would just sneeze right into the pop filter. Oh my gosh, let it let it let it filter out. It would just sound like a soft whisper, then oh, yeah, no you know, one would just, notice the pop filter would just catch it all. <laughs> it's because I was thinking about that big hat and my authority cascaded down into mm. my you know olfactory yeah. rebellion that I'm experiencing. Yeah, you're thinking here. about a big feathery plume, yeah, it's like I'm not gonna I, if this guy wants me to stop sneezing, I will <laughs> because he's just. He's just envi just envisioning my big scary hat is there you go, you know, making sure that I can control myself. Um, well, I think there's 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 kind of two aspects to this this bit of feedback here, which is like, you know, yes, there is the whole thing about the ink, the pen, and the paper together in terms of like how that can enhance your experience or whatever, or just like some people might overlook one part, yeah, and and be kind of missing out on maybe an aspect of the writing experience that could be you know, enriched. Yeah. If um, your first experience with, with a fountain have. pen, if your first experience with a fountain pen is on terrible paper, you're not going to get hooked into the experience. It's going to be harder, right? You know, but even just the type of paper you use, like you could be really into, well, actually, so what I've usually heard in the past from people is like, oh, I, I, I exclusively use extra fine or fine nibs because they're writing on legal pads or using some, you know, just inkjet paper that yeah. they're, you know, have at work or whatever, whatever kind of cheap notebooks. But then and they're like, how would ever, like they don't understand why anybody would want to write with like broader nibs or stubs or anything like that. But when you get decent paper that is more ink resistant, then immediately everything is going to write finer because it's not going to soak up as much in the paper and it's going to look crisper. The shading is going to be more intense. Um, it really is, it, it makes quite a difference. Sort of like if you're printing out a photo on just like inkjet paper and it looks kind of flat and not a lot of color versus like really high quality photo paper and the colors pop yeah, and that's, it's crisper. It's, it's exactly it the, same the exact same kind thing. of idea. I didn't really idea. think about that, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like that. Now granted like actual photo paper is not for fountain pens, but it's kind of that similar idea of just how like dramatically different can look literally just by changing the paper. Um, so that's that's a big deal. Or just, you know, experimenting with ink and stuff like that. Um, but for me personally, like when I first got into fountain pens, what I really enjoyed about the experience, I didn't have a lot of money when I first got into it. I know now it's like, oh, okay, I got a ton of pens, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't that way for a very long time. And I had a bunch of Pelican scripts and I had you know, Quaco classic sports and platinum preppies and things like that. And those were my pens that I had to use. Um, so for me, using different nib sizes, using different paper, different ink, that was what gave me a variety of writing experience. Um, and so if you are, you know, willing to clean a lot of pens and, you know, change up the combinations of things that you use, you can get a lot of really good experiences with a fairly minimal amount of supplies. Um, it's not like you have to be constantly buying new stuff or spending a whole ton of money. Um, some of it is like, yeah, some ink just flows a little wetter in some pens and others and some the feed design is just whatever, for whatever reason happens to be more conducive to certain inks and it can look, you know, even the same ink with the same nib size, just the way that it flows through the pen can make it a little wetter or help the dry time. And, you know, so there's like, there's a lot of nuances to, to, you know, learn over time just by mixing things in different combinations and just like kind of by doing some math. So say you have like three pens, two notebooks and maybe eight inks, right? Which eight is a lot, I guess, if you're just starting out, that's 48 different combinations yeah. that you can have just from a relatively modest number of things. Um, and then, you know, for me, I think that's where like, it's a kind of thing like the journey is the reward. Yes. You know, I've always felt like there is no end goal to be achieved for me at least in the fountain pen hobby it's different for other people some people are they're just they need a better enough experience and then once they 
meet that, then they're like, cool, I have my supplies and I'll just reorder these or I have them and I'll just, when I wanna write something nice or write a nicer note, I'll use this pen, use this ink, and then that gets the job done and I'll move on with my life. That's that's probably a lot of people. That's probably most people who are, use fountain pens. But um, for those of us who are super into it, it's just the, you know, oh, I already have a bunch of pens that I really love, but there's this new ink that came out. I really want to see how it works in this pen. You know, I want to try this in my flex pen. I want to try it in my stub and see how the ink performs differently or try it on different paper. You know, that's to me, that's part of the fun is just mixing stuff up. Yeah. And rediscovering things I've already had even. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a good thing to go into the hobby knowing. Yeah. That it's going to be the journey. It's going to be the experience. Um, if if you are approaching it from a passion perspective, sure. if you are entering it as like how I entered the safety razor thing, like mm -hmm. I, I feel like I want to save money. I don't want to throw away all these cartridges after cartridges. I don't want to spend a yeah. ton of money. Um, I only need my one thing. If you're coming into fountain pens for that, mm -hmm. then maybe you don't need to know. You just need to yeah. get in, get what you want and get out, um, which is totally fine. But if you're coming from, you know, a passion, interest, hobby perspective, mm -hmm. knowing this will make, you're going to have a better time. And, you know, it's going to be just more rewarding more quickly. Yeah. And you're not going to get discouraged either with you do encounter a little bit of a roadblock, like mm -hmm. paper that doesn't behave well or an ink that's way wetter than you want it to be, knowing that it's just simply, okay, this is just a matter of this team that I've put together not playing super well together. I just mm. need to put, you know, bench somebody, bring somebody else out, mm. see how well this new team works together. Mm -hmm. And it's fun if you think of it, of it that way. Cause then when you do find something, you're like, yes. And it's yeah. so exciting. It looks so good. It's just what you wanted. And then you got to go find another one. Yeah. I think it, it, it comes down to like, um, I forget what concept this is. There's somebody, uh, it's like a kind of an, economic concept or something like that. But it's basically like when you have a product, you're you're hiring it to do a job. And there's somebody that's kind of behind that methodology. It's not like minimalism or something, but it's it kind of fits into that. But basically like, yeah, if you if you're looking for a fountain pen, kind of like you with your shaving stuff, it's like you're look you're essentially hiring a product to do a job yeah, for you. Exactly. But I think like anything that you're kind of passionate about and kind of into it it's honestly the job that you're hiring it to do is not to write some specific way, but it's almost like there's some desire or need that you have. Almost it's like more of an emotional or a, like a self-identifying thing. And you're like looking for a product that speaks to that. So I think it's just interesting, like thinking about like, what are you actually looking for this thing to do? Yeah. I think that's the way to maybe approach it. Like for me, I'm like, at this point, I'm like, I don't need any more pens to do things for me. At this point, it's more of like part of who I am is a person that has a wide knowledge and can be a resource, you know, around a lot of different types of pens. So it's not so much about acquiring like one more pen or this, that, the other. It's more of just like, it's almost like more of my identity, like who I am is somebody who has a very broad and deep knowledge. Well, you're acquiring experience and knowledge. Exactly. Like that, so, that's your thing is like, I am acquiring information about yeah. these things. So I'm going to approach, you know, acquiring a given pen in a very different way than somebody else who's like trying to meet a very specific need. Yeah. Your, your curiosity has always been a major driving factor oh, yeah. of your acquisitions. Well, and, I, and I'm that way with everything. Like yeah. when I start getting into anything, you like, just want to know more about all of it. Well, like, I, I I always approach things like when I get into something like puzzles, for example, I got into that really, especially with COVID, you know, I was at home a lot and, you know, that kind of stuff wasn't going out. So I started getting into puzzles. Well, I didn't just get into puzzles and like stick with one puzzle. I was like, oh, here's a three by three. Well, I'm really curious how the four by four and the five by five work and the different algorithms. And so I ended up acquiring like just a vast variety of different types of puzzles because part of the fun for me was having like a breadth of experience. Yeah. That's not necessarily everybody's approach to things, you know, but I, you know, when I got into fountain pens, like literally the first order I ever placed for fountain pens before we were even selling them, I ordered as many different things with different nib sizes to just dive in with breadth of experience. Yeah. 
because I didn't know what I didn't know. So yeah, even yeah. now when we don't really need to learn about something, you always you you approach a new fountain pen like, oh, I wonder if it can do this. I wonder if it's the same as this one. I wonder yeah. if like if I compare these two, which one you know? I, it's we don't really need to know, Brian. Like no yeah. one no one knows about that old pen that we've never carried. Like no no no, someone will figure I'm it like, out. I need to know this. Yeah yeah, just because it's just good to know. Yeah. Or it's like you know we have a certain pen that comes out in a in a special edition. It's a given color, and I'm like ah, I really I want to be able to reference that color in the future. So I'm gonna get that pen just so that we can have it on hand you know or um you know a pen that comes out in a nib size like when we first picked up sailor it was like yeah i don't really care about the fine and the medium and all that kind of stuff it's like i wanted like the medium fine and the zoom mm -hmm. and the music because it's yeah. like those are different nibs i want to know about those nibs and use them and so all the first pens that i was picking up was those very specific ones so like even if it's a nib size that i know i like and a pen that i know you know well I'm more inclined to get something that I don't even prefer as much mm -hmm. just because it's a different nib size because I want the breadth of experience. Yeah, and that's just me. That. That's my style. But to me, it's like that is part of the experience and the journey, you know? Um, yeah. So. Yeah. I think all of these were really good talking points. There were a lot of other answers as well, but these were the ones that stuck out to me as having the most, like either the ones that were little, like the most poignant or the ones that just had the most responses. So that's cool. Um, yeah. So hopefully that was inter interesting to you. Not a lot of, you know, A's to the Q's, not a lot of Q's actually, but... Uh, yeah, we're just more talking about our yeah, experience. Just, Didn't give me as much to deep dive on Drew. I will be honest, when I was prepping for this, I was like, this feels weird. I'm like, I'm done too fast in this research. Like, it just, I'm just kind of sharing my opinion. Yeah, like, we're just I'm chatting. Not, I'm not getting into anything it's deeply so here. so super cash, Brian. Yeah, well, okay. Well, we'll see how it feels. We'll see, we'll see how y'all like it. And, you know, if you like this style, we can certainly mix this in and do it more. You know, we can obviously go deeper on specific questions. But if you like the themed stuff where we kind of engage with, you know, y'all as the fans more, then cool, we'll do that. Um, uh, but so if you're an audio listener and you want to shoot us some questions, you can email us at pencast at gulepens.com. Otherwise, we'll throw things up on Instagram or up on YouTube community, or you can always comment down on the uh, YouTube channel as well uh, on these videos. So that's what we got for Q&A this week. Um, now it is time to spotlight and show y'all some very cool, very fancy looking Machia pens. Yes. Okay. So Drew, you want me you want me to be the hand model, huh? Yeah, you be the hand model. All right. You I'll can explore. I'll explore. What do you want to start with here? We've got Oh, the, I want to start with not having terrible video. We've got the Tachia Miyabi Empress Whispering Pond. Hang on, let me look let me let me let me WB and then the, this thing. The honey bee. Let's show the honey bee first. Because the whispering pond is a little more expensive, a little fancier. Oh, okay. Well, we'll not whisper so we're gonna that build, pond yet. We're going to build up to it. So I mean, they're both the, really nice pens. This is the honeybee. Yeah. Wooden wooden case, Tatcha engraved in there in the top. That's pretty cool. So presentation is great. And they have a nice little letter in here. Certificate of purchase, talking about the 20th anniversary. Signed by Shu Jen, the founder. Um, Shu Jen goes to a lot of pen shows. So you can I actually did her. not know that she was the founder. Yeah, she is. I know she was head honcho, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that she actually founded the company. Yeah, That's she's cool. been doing it, man. Um, and then it's got the number for the pen. So each pen is numbered and the number is written on the well, pen. Well, congratulations to her on the 20th anniversary. Heck yeah, it's a big deal. Uh, this got in this little piece of paper here. I don't know. Is it blotting paper? It feels it looks kinda textured. Like, it feels kind of like blotting paper. It doesn't describe what it is for, but it looks cool either way. Um, and then Tachi does this with a lot of their higher end pens as they have these cool pen wraps, which definitely would help to protect the pen as you're carrying it around. Got some extra little cards and whatnot, talking about warranty information and stuff that's less exciting. Um, comes with converter and some cartridges. So again, this is a Sailor nib on here. So it's gonna use the standard Sailor goodies. So there's a, there's a relationship there that Tachi has with Sailor. Um, Sailor does not just go throwing their nibs around willy nilly. No, they do not. To other companies. Um, it's got a bottle of ink in here as well, blue ink, and then let's get to the good stuff, right? This is the pen. So it nests in here in this little, you know, kind of velvety type material. And this pen is so cool. I don't even know how much the video will do it justice, just with the lighting and whatnot. But we have great pictures and stuff that we can also include. Um, really cool looking. It's got this honeycomb. So this is all maquillé. This is all hand painted. Um, nothing mass produced here. Super tight details. I mean, you've got gold dust, you got abalone shell, 
you know, hand burnished and stuff like that. It's beautiful. And then in the wings here, like on the B, I don't know what kind of shell that is in there, but it's different than abalone shell. I think it's probably quail. It, or do you think it's just shiny? I don't know if it's quail. It, it could be, I don't know if it's like a white mother of pearl or something. It is, it is shiny. Oh, so it okay. seems like some other kind of shell. Gotcha. Um, not a quail egg. That, that we'll see on the other pen, I think. Um, and then like even the bee's eye is some kind of like shiny. Oh, yeah. Sh I don't know what it is in there, but it's something, something different. So just like the, 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 the detail around the bee. And then I love the clip too. The clip, I, I this is, looks really cool. So it's got, you know, speckled gold here and then abalone that kind of cuts up and, and, you know, divides the clip. I think it looks beautiful. That is stunning. And the whole pan just like, it looks phenomenal. They did a really, really good job with this one. Um, and then even just to get like the honeycomb to match up. Oh, it does match up. Yeah, between the cap and the body. Um, and then I can't remember. Yeah, and then the, the grip. Oh, of course. Look at that. Abalone on there. Um, then of course you can see the nib. So this is made by Sailor, but it's branded with Tatia. Mm -hmm. So this is something specially, because normally the larger nib like this does not have, um, uh, it's, it's normally 21 karat, not 18. Right. So that's something special for Tatia. So nice looking pen, very large in size. For me, in my hand, it looks natural. Like it's, it's a bigger pen. Um, it can be posted on here, I believe. I think it's got... Does it have the little liner? No, it doesn't have any specific liner in there, but it's it's an ebonite pen uh, or hard rubber pen, I should say. So you, well, uh, I probably wouldn't post it honestly because it's got a spring loaded cap in there. Oh, okay. you know, sort of like the uh, like Esther Brooks got a spring loaded mm -hmm. cap. So that spring loading is wanting to kind of push the cap off. So I just wouldn't I wouldn't bother posting it. But it's not a heavy pen, even though it looks big. It's very light. Um, that's where that hard rubber comes in but just a beautiful pen. Absolutely. So, yeah. You know, you mentioned hand burnished. Do you know what they actually polish this thing with? I don't know specifically a this A piece pen. of charcoal? Charcoal, yeah. I know that charcoal is like commonly used in Mafia. They like just scrub the thing yeah. with charcoal. Yeah, it's like slightly abrasive, but not yeah. too much, yeah. And the final polishing, and we can put up some uh, some pictures and some videos we've got from yeah. Tachia. Um, the final polishing compound, you're going to love this. Mm. What do you think the final polishing step is? Uh, they rub it with their thumb. I'm just guessing. You are 100% correct. Is that really what yes. they do? That's so yes. cool. How did you know? I'm like, wow. Well, yes. they, they sent us they sent us like some video stuff. I haven't looked at it they yet. They do. I watch it's it. fingers. No, I joke because we always joke about my thumb. I do, yes. Like my thumb can fix almost anything on a pen. Yes. It's like, is this spot? Should we return this? Brian's like, here, let me see it. Let me well, see if I can just. That's but, right. Yeah. They, they, they thumb it out. Well, how that, about the that? The final, yes. Sounds like I should be a Machia artist. You should, yeah, that's the all magical, it takes. Magical thumbs. That's all it takes. So gorgeous pen, gorgeous pen. It just looks phenomenal, especially if you're into bees. Um, I think that one is one of the best looking pens. It's I've also ever funny if you on. ever get like a fingerprint on a brand new pen and you wonder like, did my retailer touch this during a pen cast? <laughs> I mean, in this case, the answer is yes, but also the answer is, well. I'm going to wipe it down before I yeah, officially Yeah, we, we always it do. Up, but yeah. it, it, interestingly enough, like, the finger rub is the final step. That's right. Hey, you know, it's natural. Your, your fingers are going to rub on the pens anyway when you grab them. All right. Same packaging on this one. So again, this is the Whispering Pond version. So uh, Empress size, same size, uh, different paper, um, but still it's got the same commemorative certificate dealio on here. This also happens to be number five, which is pretty cool. Um, got a different wrap. I don't know if they're identical because we only have we only have one of each of these pens right now. Um, so I don't know if the wrap is exactly the same on every pen or if they mix up the wraps. Um, but anyway, this wrap is cool. Of course, it's blue, so I like it a lot. Mm, it matches nice. the pen. It does. Um, so let me set the accoutrement aside and get it out of its little compartment. Looks like a different here. color ink, too. This ink it looks purple, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it is purple ink. So this is this pen has a blue base to it. Oh, so, that is not something you see every day. No, it's very cool, especially and, with this much you know other stuff happening on it. No clip on this pen. This is a clipless, oh. which is kind of interesting. Um, but I mean, just the amount of rod on this thing My is God. like just amazing looking. Um, yeah, so much rod. It's just fantastic. And here um, you've got the Renkaku. This, yeah, so this is the quail egg shell. Yeah. So that looks slightly different than what you have on the B. Um, white pops a lot more. 
but the detail on this is phenomenal. And then you've got the, um, oh, I can never remember if it's Togodashi or Taka. I mix the two up, but whichever one is like the raised, like multiple layers, kind of like a three-dimensional feel to yeah. it. That's what you have on here. I want to say that's, uh, I, I always mix them up, so I, I'm not confident which one it is, but it's that technique. And even still on this one too, you can see that like the pattern goes so seamlessly from cap to bottom. right up. Yeah, so they do a very intentional job of that. And then just I love the way that the rod and kind of like falls away, almost as if it's like, you know, just- Like a waterfall. Just disintegrating, yeah, yeah. like a waterfall. Um, but it definitely looks like, you know, like a pond. Like the pond, I guess the, this is the, I don't know, the rodden is the land, and then the pond is, you know, this part up here, and you've got the, you know, Oh, the flowers let's see these dragonflies. Here. Oh yeah, where are the dragon, where is it? Oh yeah, up here. in the top there. Yeah, the dragonfly wings have some rod in oh, there too. Oh, that's stunning. Isn't that cool? Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah, just pens like this, they're Man. like, they're really pieces of art. And you can just sit here and study them and just even every piece of shell. This is all natural abalone shell. And everything and you put can just, on one at a time. Yeah, hand. hand placed, hand cut, you know, to because these shells, they're like, they're kind of like clam shells. They're round, they're, you know, these don't come in like thin sheets. No. Like, I don't even know the process for making these abalone shell to use on here. That's part of the, you know, what they keep proprietary, but to place this much shell must take forever, which is part of where the cost, I mean, honestly, that's where most of the cost comes from is just straight up labor um, for manufacturing these. And then um, let's unscrew this. And then on the grip of this one, you got some dragonfly. Just, is it two dragon? Yeah, you got two dragonflies. So one of them looks like it has like red, red wings on there with some little wispies. And then it's got a rotten wing dragonfly on there. Just beautiful looking. Jeez. I love the, I love the grip. I love the details I on know. the grip of these pens. Cause it's like a little fun surprise when you kind of open it up. You, you know, you, know, you it can might... feel a little bit of the texture as you're holding it in your hand, which is cool. Yeah. And it's resilient too. It is. This is super durable stuff. I mean, Urushi lacquer is, basically the hardest natural finish that you can get, um, you know, without going to like a, a chemically altered, you know, type of a finish, you know, a catalyzed lacquer or something. This is the hardest natural finish you can get. So looks beautiful and uh, yeah, it's very cool. Glad we were able to show these off. I'm glad we had, you know, them available and be able to play with them a little bit. Definitely. Sounds and like I need to keep each of these in my collection. I for think future you should at least reference. have the blue one. I mean, I mean, it is the anniversary edition, right? Like, yeah. I mean, if you <laughs> if you really want to support your manufacturers, mm, Brian, these pens fall into the uh, not a no brainer. These yeah. are these are brainer ones. These are the ones you need to really ask Rachel about. I need to run it past my boss to uh, consider adding to any type of collection, but. The gorgeous pens. Congratulations to Tatya and to Shu Jen for 20 years. Uh, it's pretty amazing to see what you're putting out now after 20 years. It's, it's kind of incredible. So that's what we got uh, the Tatya. All right, that's it for the educational portion of this. Now it's time for absolute nonsense, Drew, in our what's happening segment. It's my favorite. So what you've got going on? Uh, well, I started a new old video game. Oh, what you um, got? I wanted to uh, jump into an Assassin's Creed game, which since mm. I'm a big fan of that series, mm -hmm. or I was a big fan of that series, it kind of went in a direction. It, it went to a place I couldn't follow, unfortunately. Oh. They kind of changed the formula a little bit, and I bought one of the newer ones, and it's mm. just, it's very big mm. and very... Also, what do you mean big? Like, like the, 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 like the world. The it's world just is big? massive. I feel like that's around a it's lot like too, of video too games big. are going. It's too big. It's mm. too big. So I tried it. So my thing was, I could play the one that takes place in ancient Greek, mm -hmm. Greece, mm -hmm. um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, mm -hmm. or I could go because I never finished it. I gave up on that one because I just didn't. I wasn't feeling it. Okay. Or I could go back and play one that I knew I liked, the mm -hmm. one that takes place in Victorian London. Mm -hmm. And so I went back and played the one I knew I liked. So okay. I'm playing Assassin's Creed Syndicate, which is you know kind of a bit of a Gangs of New York style, okay. you know, uh, 1860s, I think. You know, I think between mm -hmm. 1860s and, you know, right at, you know, the late 1800s. Um, yeah. So it's it's so much fun. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. The music's great. The setting is great. It's all just kind of like, you know, wet and rainy and dark and very metropolitan, which these newer ones, mm -hmm. you got one that's you know, takes place, 
in you know Viking times, you know, oh, okay. uh, yeah. ancient Greece and you know ancient Egypt, very big yeah. but not metropolitan. Like mm. I love you know my favorite Assassin's Creed games were like in you know Renaissance Italy and uh, you know uh, revolutionary France and this one and mm. uh, just I like that setting. So this is very much my jam. So I'm enjoying that. Um, and uh, you can play as a um, as a pair of uh, brother and sister, you know, Jacob and Evie, mm-hmm. and you can switch between them at any time. Mm-hmm. So that's fun. I like just kind of arbitrary rules. You know, if I'm like doing something stealthy and important, I play as Evie because she just as a character has kind of her stuff together a little bit more. Jacob's a little bit more of a wild card. So if I'm just kind of like starting fights with gangs or, you know, trying to, you know, sneak in and steal this one thing, I'm kind of him. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I like, I like that. It feels... Like I am inhabiting those characters. So okay. that's been fun. Um, since we watched a bunch of shows together, Shannon and myself, that uh, she more or less got to pick. The deal was that she would watch a Star Wars show with me after we finished oh. Ted Lasso. So we were watching Andor, okay. uh, which I thought was the best Star Wars show to watch with her because it is very non-Star Warsy. Yeah, you don't have um, to like know all the canon. You don't know at, to You don't have to know anything okay not a thing um they introduce everything there's no lightsabers there's very little blastering you know there's probably like you know one or two shootouts Mm. but uh, really it's about just the effects of dictatorship and the kind of life cycle of uh fascism and rebellion and you can kind of take that Mm. life cycle and apply it to so many things in history Mm -hmm. And it really is about oppression and mm. how oppression begets rebellion. And it's just, I find that fascinating. It's a really mm. good show. She's liking it-ish. She, she, she's, she's hanging in there. She's hanging in there. Yeah. You know? But for her, I said, hey, you know what? We can put subtitles on because she loves subtitles. She wants subtitles on everything. Oh, really? Okay. And I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I, I'm all about the experience, the unadulterated mm-hmm. experience. But since we're watching it in the living room, not the den where, you know, the big TV is, I'm like, that's eh, fine. It's, as long as she's watching it with me, whatever, we'll do subtitles because hmm. I'm sure some of the terminology, she's like, wait, what do they call that thing? Hmm. But unfortunately, while these subtitles do provide some clarity, <clears throat> whichever body or professional was in charge of creating these subtitles just did not want to get creative with the sound effects. Mm. So every single sound effect is described as whooshing or whirring. <laughs> everything, every door, every ship, every everything is a whoosh. Whooshes, whooshing, whooshes, whooshes softly, whooshing. <laughs> it's just constant. It is constant. There are whooshes everywhere. And it's, it's getting mm. to the point where it's kind of distracting because it's comedic. Mm. And I'm like, I'd like for her to take this show seriously because it's a really good show. But there's so many freaking whooshes. Interesting. We can't. It's just, huh. oh, and sometimes even the quiet, they don't need, they could just say nothing and it would be fine. Like every time a door opens anywhere, whooshing. Like, all right. It, it's and it takes place in like space. So there's yes, like doors so opening. So many whooshes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's exhausting. And I'm like, it's getting to the point where it's actually just taking away from the experience because mm. of whoever typed in these subtitles. So that's annoying because she's just like giggling at the whooshes. I'm like, this is a good show, Shannon. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, so I'm dealing with the whooshes. Okay. But um, yeah, uh, Father's Day was this weekend. It was. So uh, that was on Sunday. I had a great Father's Day. I was, um, I-, I told my wife and my son, the only thing I want is to go to a Greasy Spoon Diner and to come home and watch Back to the Future with them in, in, in the den with the love sack and the big TV. That is a very specific and, and low maintenance request. That is pretty easy. Would yeah. You? Yeah. So we did. We went to City Diner downtown over by the Science Museum. Mm-hmm. Um, it's right across the street from the D, right across the street from the DMV. Um, and then, uh, yeah, got there early. So probably like uh, 830 you know, from a, for Saturday morning, that's for Sunday morning. That's very early. So right, uh, we got seated immediately. Nice. It was so good, Brian. Like it's so good. I mm. just I got. I I love so much a breakfast place that gives me a bread option mm. as a a short stack of pancakes. Mm. Like that is just if if when when like instead of toast you could get toast grits 
short stack or something else. And when Those what, all sound good. Uh, well, yeah, of course. But like when I have a short stack of pancakes as my bread option, oh my God, I just, there, there's some, there's a receptor in my brain that only lights up for that one moment mm. and boom, <laughs> it blinks right there. And my God, it is so, so enjoyable. <laughs> I was sitting there just telling them like, man, I love you guys. Short stack of pancakes on the side. That's, oh. that's Drew's like, would you like, would you like there. toast or pancakes? I'm like, y'all want pancakes? <laughs> yeah. You kidding me? Heck yeah. Who says toast? So that was delightful. Not only that, but I don't, the, the, you know, um, I, I don't know if uh, my, you know, non-American friends will know what canned corned beef hash looks like. But uh, if you're from the southern United States, you probably know what a can of corned beef hash looks like. And it looks like dog food. It's not pretty. No, it doesn't look good. But I freaking love it. And when I go to a restaurant and they've got like homemade corned beef hash, I'm like, all right, that's fine. But I know for a fact that City Diner in Richmond has the canned stuff. Wow, you prefer it can. Sometimes, yeah. Wow. If I'm in that sort you of are easy to please. If Drew. I'm if I'm in that sort of diner, yes. I love a good, you know, you know, homemade corned beef hash. If I'm at some bougie breakfast place, yeah, sure. Give me the homemade yeah. stuff. That's not greasy spoon diner no, type. Thing. I you go into a place like that, I expect the canned corned beef hash. Wow. And I got it and it was perfect. It was it was crusty on the outside, just I like I like, and oh mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm having an experience. You're like we're living an experience. Oh my god, it was so, so good. funny. So yeah, I got that. Got some <laughs> eggs. Got oh, it was everything. Wow, it was everything. So that was delightful. And they brought me a couple little Father's Day trinkets. They got they got me this new Yeti. It's I was great. gonna say that green is like it's loud. Kermit the Frog, yeah. like <gasps> jumping out. That makes me yeah. like it even more. That's what I think when I see it. I like it. It's my or Kermit. Ninja Turtle. It's I a think. Kermit mug. Yeah. Um. So this is cool. I, I'm I'm. This is my first day with it. Uh, it's a Yeti. Uh, I don't know how many ounces it is, but it's got mm. a handle. I don't know how I feel about the handle. I, I'm not a three mm. three finger handle. Not not a huge fan of. Yeah, I like a handle that's you can fit all four. Yeah, fingers. so I, I like haven't, to be able to like. I mm. haven't been using the handle, but and but it, and it's a uh, threaded lid. So, oh, um, interesting. That's a little interesting. So I have I've actually been turning it around that way so that I'm just kind of holding it and just putting some fingers okay. into the handle, not actually using the handle. The handle is kind of an afterthought. Yeah, but I will say that the handle is good for if I'm bringing this thing inside at the end of the day, I don't have to de dedicate a whole handful of mug. Mm. I can pinky you can it, ring it with ring it. the, yeah. yeah, you can ring it. I'm mm -hmm. like, so the handle is good yeah. for just I don't, casual. I don't have that with my beloved Contigo. Yeah, I so. Don't, you know, there's no ring to hold on to. So, so far so good. Um, it still does have the magnetic slidey thing, but you have to uh, push it down to slide it forward. Oh, so, so it like locks in a little tight. It is. The other one was just a magnet that was sitting on top of another magnet. So mm. I don't think it was as secure. Okay. So this one's more secure, but it's a little harder to use. You want use. something that if you like knock it over in your car, you're not gonna like slowly I haven't, leak that's what iced the, coffee that's all one, over the That's what the other one does. It's pretty mm -hmm. good for splashes, but not if you knock it over. Nah. So not, I haven't not. tested it with this one yet, but I'm assuming that's why they made the change. Hmm. Either way, birthday present, uh, sorry, Father's Day present. They also got me a Back to the Future t-shirt, which I had already decided Back to the Future was going to be my Father's Day movie. They got me a rad t-shirt to go with it. They nice. did not know that. Did you and wear then, the t-shirt while you watched the movie? No, I wore it yesterday. Okay. So I watched the movie okay. on Sunday, wore my shirt yesterday. Okay. Um, and then they got me a little miniature, you know, those little things that they have at Barnes and Noble at the checkout. They're these little random boxes of little trinkets, like a little sure. mini Zen garden or like a, look, oh, yeah, yeah. a little mini Dwight bobblehead or a button that makes a sound effect. They found a little Ghostbusters trap. Um, so they <laughs> nice. got me that. So it makes sounds, it lights up little things. Oh, it's fold fun. open. That's fun. So yeah, they did. They did. They did pretty good. It's like the adult version of a Happy Meals toy, yes, basically. <laughs> exactly. So that was nice. Cool. Um, went back, watched Back to the Future. Uh, it was amazing. Still makes me cry when George kisses Lorraine and Marty comes back and starts playing the song again because his hand's not disappearing anymore. Ah, oh, I love it so much. So yeah, Back to the Future wins, and then. Another movie happened on Monday. So I took Archer to watch Into the, not Into the Spider-Verse, uh, Across the Spider-Verse. Across the Spider-Verse? I don't know, the second Spider-Verse movie. Don't, on, don't hold on to me, we'll drown yeah, together. Across the Spider-Verse, <laughs> I think. So, um, I know, yeah. The art style was amazing. Like the animation huh. that is happening right now, they're getting really creative with it. And it was a beautiful effort for, you know, ADHD person going into this movie. 
it is just a sensory delight mm. because every single scene is just you can just absorb it all there's so much going on but mm. not not an overwhelming amount of right. going on not not busy mm. but so many things to pay attention to and notice and so it was just a delight two and a half hours for this animated movie wow. but i did not it, it, it flew that's such a long time for it, a movie. you'd think but yeah. it's not at all it, mm. it, it really was paced really well so um amazing movie just amazing from beginning to end however it ended abruptly and I later find find out that there's going to be a sequel in March of next year. Mm. So a very close sequel. It should have been called Part One. Mm. Okay. I wish it was. I wish I would have been told that because we left the theater disappointed. An amazing movie. Yeah. But we walked out feeling like it's like incomplete. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, you know, and that that's a shame. Like it's like uh, when you're watching like a series finale to a show, and you're just like. There's five minutes left. How are they going to wrap all this up? And then yes. it turns out it's like to be continued. And you're like, dag on it. Yeah, like, and, that, and and like like <laughs> that's fine. Like I would have walked out of, out of the theater, like man, that was awesome. I can't wait for the next one. If I had known that that was going to happen. Mm. But as it is, it left us just kind of like, yeah, well, that was good. But man, I I want to see how it turned out. You know. Yeah. And so yeah, I I, I wish yeah. I would have been told that. Maybe you don't. I'm sorry, but I feel like I'm doing you a favor. So. Take it up with I guess you someone else. Sort of spoiled it, but sort of didn't. Yeah, no, I'm not I mean, going to say anything about the movie. I, well, if you look online, you're going to see that there's another one coming out in March. Like okay. clearly, so that's like you know, out there in the world. It should, yeah, it is. It definitely. Did you is. not know it at the time? I feel like I heard it, but I forgot. But that doesn't necessarily um, mean they're going to like leave it so open ended. Yeah. Even if you hear there's another movie coming, it is a. It's kind of like um, Matrix two and three. The okay. first one had a very solid ending, but when they did two and three they knew that it was a continuation of the same yeah. story. So it was just still like wrapped up the movie. It's kind of, eh, kind of sort of, I haven't seen the matrix. They, in a while. they didn't wrap it up. Great. Um, okay. It's kind of, it's kind of like this, but anyway, it was an excellent movie. Glad mm. to have it happened. We went to, um, Cine Bistro in Stony point. Oh, nice. And they got new chairs. They, oh. they electronically recline now. Ooh. Oh yeah. Wow. That was very nice. But they took bread pudding off the dessert menu. Ooh. Mm hmm. And you know, that's like my happy place. You do like with, bread pudding. I know. So that was a shame. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, Archer spent the weekend watching a new show and as a parent and as many of you out there are parents, I know you understand this. Sometimes your kid finds a show and loves it and you just think it's the worst piece of crap you've ever seen. Oh yeah. That's most of parenting. It is. It is. And you don't want to hate on it because you're like, that's fine. You do you. I remember liking Power Rangers and my I was constantly looking over like who's going to judge me for watching this, you know, and I don't want him to feel that way. Sure. Um, I was probably a little too old to be watching Power Rangers, but whatever. I didn't care. I liked it. Well, but, it, came, but it came out when we were already of a certain age. Yeah, know? but but I did feel judged like, you know, hmm. my dad, you know, never just like kind of, I don't know. He didn't say anything negative, but I knew that he thought it was stupid. My grandfather's thought it was stupid. And I mean, to be fair, it is kind of stupid. It is, but it's it like... doesn't matter. If a kid, let the kid like what he wants to like. I feel like the quality of shows now is definitely better it than is. what we had growing up. But still. It is, but I want to. I want him to just, if you enjoy it, dude, you go for it. Yeah. So when you, he found a new show, started watching it, and uh, it's called um, uh, Steven Universe. I had never heard of it. I've never I, heard I, of I, it. I think I'd heard of it, but I didn't know any details. Okay. Um, I'm paying a little bit attention out of the, you know, periphery of my brain. And I started Googling it. It's won awards from GLAAD, from hmm. a, like the, you know, other an kids animation awards. It's got a, like 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. It's like, I was like, oh my God. He picked. He like naturally picked something he good. He naturally picked. <laughs> A great show, like an objectively great show. That's always good. Um, oh my God. It's like, <laughs> I, so I'm like, I don't say anything. Like if he wants to talk to you about it, talk to him about it. But you, I don't want to make him move on to some other piece of crap. Like this is good. I hope he continues with it. Mm. It's got, you know, great representation in it. The person, the, the person who created it is an actual like creative professional who like is this was a passion project of hers? I'm like, oh my god! Like, yeah, yeah they're not just, just like a business tycoon. Yes, that, exactly. Yeah. It's not just a you know Netflix AI generated you know mm. content piece of garbage. Which, like, not to not to point out too much, Drew, but that's exactly what Power Rangers was. Power Rangers was a already existing TV show in Japan, 
And it literally was. was just a business entrepreneur who was like, I could just repackage, repackage this. It. Yeah. No, you're shoot right. Shoot some terrible acting with American actors yeah. in between and then just take this exact same footage and VO it. No, I, I, that <laughs> that's what Power Rangers was. Complete, yeah, absolutely. Complete yeah. cash grab. An effective, very probably the most Incredibly effective. Incredibly effective yeah. cash grab. Billion, so. multiple billion. I think it was like $25 billion or something, something like that. Yeah, uh, Heim, Heim Saban did that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, Sabans or whatever, yeah. but yeah, I was I'm, I was so pleasantly surprised by this. Hmm. So uh, nice, yeah. I hope I hope it keeps up. So that's awesome. Just, yeah, I just like that and like apps and games. Like I just want him to mm. play things and watch things. I don't care about the content itself. I just want him to play games mm. and watch shows and movies that were made by creators. Mm. You know, made by a professional game developer who had you know, a vested interest in the project, you know, yeah. made, like written by writers who, you know, thought about what would be the best story to tell, like what, what it's about. I don't care. Mm. Just d watch and play things that are real, like made by creative like, professionals. I feel like that's going to become more of I a know. thing it is. from now moving forward. It's yeah. going to be harder to find. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. And it's only getting worse. You know, that's the, that's what the whole writer's strike is about yeah. or a big portion of it at yeah. least. So, suffice to say, I'm very happy that he's finding he's making something making some real. good yes, life choices. So it far. is. It That's is, cool. Yeah. That's cool. And I've been sewing a lot of patches on. Still, um, you know, working on my jacket. Okay. Um, in fact, I've got a Kermit patch in the mail. So, hey. yeah. Kermit's hey. gonna go right here on the uh, shoulder. I've got a. No, I promise. I've got Green Lantern and Mega Man here, and I'm gonna have Kermit and the Star Wars Rebel Alliance symbol on the other shoulder. So, still waiting on those two. Nice. Um, but I did add. Uh, the, the, some license plates. I got the Back to the Future license plate and the Ghostbusters license plate nice. up in kind of my left armpit area. And <laughs> um, and then uh, let's see, I added uh, Frog from Chrono Trigger on my back there, oh. and then a Mega Man life bar, which is like all his energy <laughs> level. That's over on my pocket there. Nice. So all good. Still very much obsessed with that. That is my current rabbit hole That's obsession. Awesome. Like every spare minimum minute, I'm on eBay or on Etsy looking at patches, gotta get patches. patches. What's gonna be my next one? But uh, you know, as-, as the How much have you covered of the jackets? So oh, far? not much. Yeah? Like I've, I've probably put on, you know, 10 plus patches at this point. Okay, you but got a good amount of real estate to work with. Yeah, I've got a lot of real estate. Yeah. But but there are, you know, there's seams and areas where I can't really get to and anything in the front, mm. uh, the, the, you know, Levi's jean jackets have big inside pockets. Okay. So to sew something on the front, I'd have to like stick my hand down into the pocket oh, and go in and tricky. out that way. So yeah. I could probably do it if it's a pretty simple shape, yeah. but I haven't yet and kind of avoiding that. So okay. we'll see, we'll see. Let's get really big ones to yeah, you know, where you can just like cover the yeah. whole pocket with you know. Yeah, so that that's my current obsession, and uh, I'll probably get distracted and move on to something else. Do you have at any, power, any given moment. Do you have any Power Rangers patch? I thought about doing like just the lightning bolt, but I mean um, that'd be pretty fitting. It would, but I, I I don't I don't know if I might if I have space. There there are ones that I am way more into than that. Like mm. I, I found an amazing uh, rectangular ecto cooler patch mm. it's just the high c ecto cooler with slimer on it <laughs> nice. like you remember that drink right oh, I remember oh that. man if i could find the 90s if i could find if i could find a ninja turtle pie logo to put next to that one that would be my whole culinary childhood right there do you remember the ninja turtle pies ninja turtle pies they were they were like you know those like gas station wax paper like oh, yeah, those pies things? yeah it was basically that but mm. covered in a green Oh, like icing oh, gosh. and inside was like some like thick yellow cream like i probably ate that oh as a kid. man i love ninja turtles I back in the day i cannot imagine what it might taste like today but uh i i think that my, my brother sent me a clip of i believe it was always sunny in philadelphia where one of the like the, the, whichever neurotic character you know i think it was charlie day's character he bought like a whole case of them and I'm just gonna like resell them or something like that, but I'm like, oh yeah, Ninja Turtle pies. <laughs> wow, amazing. I remember the like Ninja Turtle novelty ice creams. That was oh like yeah, a Ninja Turtle head. Oh absolutely. And like the eyeballs would be gumballs or mm -hmm. whatever the heck. And, and one was always, always lower, so you'd always, always look like... at the picture and be like, oh yeah, that's a Ninja Turtle. And you open it up and it's like <laughs> this yep. disfigured thing, and you're like, ah, yep. horrified well, as there, a kid. There's a uh, local um, <laughs> you, uh, retro game shop 
mm. you know, over here in Scott's edition, that one of their favorite logos is like a melted, deformed looking Sonic the Hedgehog sticker and like one eyes it's just kind of like uh, it's like what it actually looks like that's awesome yeah that's pretty beautiful that's nice yeah well, that's it for me man fun that's fun um yeah we had a gauntlet week last week with the kids finishing up school oh yes our schedule was ridiculous because they had exams and, and you're doing a lot of chauffeur activities ones. oh my gosh rachel did most of it yeah. to be fair but yes it was like Okay, Joseph has to be brought in at 10 o'clock, and then Ellie has to be picked up at 11.15, and then Joseph has to be picked up, and it was just you like- just stay in the parking lot. Multiple times, yeah. But there are different schools oh! that are far from each other, so it was driving all over the place. But So Rachel's schedule is wrecked. But anyway, the kids finished out school, got to go to like little award ceremony for Ellie. She graduated fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So that's weird, because we're like, oh, we're like done with this school now. Like no more elementary school for us. Which is kind of crazy. Oh man! To think about, like now they're we're gonna have two middle schoolers next year. I mean, we already know we had two middle schoolers because they got me a look out middle school. They here comes got me Ellie. A, they got me a dad joke book for Father's oh, Day. Oh no! I didn't bring it. I was about to say, is that is that what's in like the fun fact part of this show? Because no, please no. Okay, thank no. you. No, to be fair, like probably half the jokes are ones that I already know oh, and have told. God. So on one hand, I'm like. Okay, these are good, but they're not new. Mm. And then the, some of the other ones are like just bad. And I'm like, okay. But see, this is like, I'm not asking for these things. Mm. It's like an unauthorized, you know, collection. I have, I probably have five different dad you joke books you now. Sew. This is like the the Tasmanian Devil Christmas tie that I would like buy for my dad. Oh yeah. You know, just like the stuff that, you know, I think it's interesting the stuff that kids pick out for you because you're like, oh, this is uh, this is how you see me, huh? It's like, they see me as the dad joke, dad, which to be fair, I do plenty of it. You, But they latch onto it pretty hard and they bring plenty of them my way too. Yeah. And it's kind of thing like, I don't even, it's not like I intentionally planted those seeds and was like, this is who I am. This is how I want you this to remember. This is my entire identity. This is how I want you to remember me when I die. Is Don't that you I do like woodworking or something? No, no, no. He just does dad jokes. Are you sure? I've, I've well, I could have sworn I remember woodworking. No, no, just I told you a jokes. little while ago when I was like walking somewhere to go do something with Joseph and he was like, dad, how come you don't have any hobbies? <laughs> right, yes. And I was like, are you freaking <laughs> kidding me? Like everybody watching this now is just like, that's laughable. Yes. But just to show like your kids just don't, they don't really pay that much attention no. to like what you do or no. what you're into. You know, I talk about like, oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a YouTuber. And they're like, no, not really. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I've only been doing YouTube for 13 years. I made 2000 some videos. Like, come on. I'm definitely a YouTuber. And they're like, well, no, you're not. Dan tdm has got 54 million followers or whatever. And I'm like, friggin' whatever. Like, okay. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> it's like the third most popular YouTube our, our ads history are, or whatever. Our ads are turned off. We don't count. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so that was fun. So finish up school, kids. They made me. They made me cards too. I didn't like take pictures of them or anything, you know. But they're still like hand drawing me cards, oh, which, yeah. is, which is kind of cool. Um, let's see here. Joseph had he drew him on the lawnmower with me like kind of beside him or whatever. And I was like, oh, that's like an evolution. That's really sweet. You know, that was really cool. Um, and then he had, I don't know, something else on there. I think he had, I, I don't remember what it was. Um, and then Ellie had like a chocolate bar and a fountain pen and like a Rubik's Cube or something like that. That's so pretty it's like, on. Well, on, they know my interest, you know, but. It was my, mine was a uh, long purple card and it said, hot diggity dog, it's Father's Day. And I opened it up and he had drawn a red hot dog down the center of it. And then he drew some character that just said, the bun is purple. <laughs> and then it just, right. and it just went, ah, <laughs> I don't know what was yelling, but okay, that was pretty much it. All right. Yeah. I'm surprised he didn't lean into the banana thing. Seems like he was kind of on point with that. <laughs> he, he probably would have if he thought about it. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I got Hot diggity dog. Yeah. That's great. Um, and then I, uh, for actual Father's Day, I had brunch with my parents. So oh, that's nice. kind of cool because my parents live nearby. Where'd you go? Um, we had brunch. My mom made brunch. Oh, at the house. Yeah. And just oh, over cool. Place. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then they live in a little like condo unit that's nice. got a pool. So we went to the pool. Nice. The kids got to play and I got to dip in the pool and stuff like that. It was pretty hot, but the water was cold. And I've talked about Rachel. She wants it to be like 
imperceptible difference in temperature between the air and the water. That's about the only time that to the point where it's not pool. refreshing at all. It's just like I'm wet now, but yeah, my temperature much, is the same. Yeah, it's pretty much that's her <laughs> ideal scenario. She wants so she like just, bath water, basically. So you she, know. Just, she just sat there under the you know on a table she with an umbrella. Her, she stuck her feet in. Oh, at some point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just enough yeah. to be like, yeah, I don't want to do that. But she's a good sport about it. She doesn't like hassle. She's still willing to go yeah. to the pool. One of my favorite like, places to play video games is by the pool. Yeah. There you go. So you, yeah, you like to experience a pool like atmosphere. I like to be around the people. Yeah, yeah. it's that's cool. I, I absorb my social activity from a distance. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I went in there. I got wet. It happened. Anyway, it was fun. Nice. Play with the kids. So just kind of cool, just chilling with the family. Are the kids uh, um, pretty good swimmers? They're fine. Yeah. This it, this particular pool is like four and a half feet deep. Oh. Okay. And they're much taller than that now, oh, yeah, so yeah, they're yeah. not really swimming gotcha much kind of walking around yeah just kind of jumping and yeah. floating and you know we got pool noodles and all that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. they just have fun um got a haircut took joseph's get a haircut too that was needed um and then yeah i just did a whole bunch of stuff outside because nice and hot this weekend did a lot of work on the driveway continued to do that Found some good material to help seal some cracks and all that kind of stuff. Um, found this asphalt resurfacing material, which is basically kind of mix like a powder and you mix it up like mortar. Um, and you can make it really thin if you wanted to kind of like skim coat, you know, and use a squeegee to, you know, because I've got like not cracks in the driveway in some places, but it's just like it's kind of worn away and it's like more like the raw, like bumpy rocks and that kind of stuff. So if you're like trying to like, you know, rollerblade or or mm -hmm. something like that or a skateboard or whatever. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It like feels super bumpy. Yeah. So I wanted to just like kind of smooth that out because the driveway ceiling won't really get that. So I found this asphalt resurfacing stuff that's really Is it good. like tar? No, not really. It's sort of like, you know, it's like when you mix up like grout or mortar or something like that. So it's like kind of gritty. Like you pat, know, like, and like you wet, patch? And you wet it. Yeah, it's not quite as thick as like a, a full patch. Okay. You know, Somewhere like, between tar and patch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it's not sticky like tar. Like okay. it basically hardens kind of like concrete. Well, yeah, you can spread so it with like, a squeegee it's really, so it's more liquidy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like if you were to mix up concrete super, super thin mm. and then just kind of like skim coat it and then it dries and it's rock hard. Gotcha. That's and kind then, of what this stuff the, is, but it's black. And know, the sealant so, will go over that. And the sealant will go over top okay. of that. Yeah. So just to kind of like fill in some of the stuff, because I've got like, you know, the driveway, I don't know exactly how old it is. We've been in the house for, I don't know, over a decade. Um, but it could easily be 20, 25 years old. So, you know, we're starting to be like some webbing, like alligator cracks and stuff like that. So this kind of product helps with that. Nice. So I found this product. I bought. I kind of bought it on a whim. I was like, I don't really know what I'm going to use. So I like bought like every different type of crack sealant, mortar, whatever, troweling kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm going to try a bunch of these and just see what works because I have a big driveway. And I'll just, again, I like to have a breadth of experience. So I just bought like a little bit of everything. Have you tried them yet? And yeah, I've tried them all. And I like that powder stuff. So I went and bought every box of it that I could find oh at God. three different Home Depots. Oh my God. Like everything north of, you know, like on the north side of Richmond. They probably thought you were a contractor. Nah, they didn't have much. They had like two boxes at one place oh, okay. and like five at another. And I've used all of them and I'm like, well, crud. Are okay, you halfway done now, yet? I mean, I'm, I guess I'm done enough now because yeah. it's like, unless I want to drive to like an hour way to fresh. So did you get the whole driveway like done? Oh, no, it's just like little bits and pieces. Oh, that, so, so it's I more like, did oh, like, oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, no, it only it's covers like a, those cracks. Like one box covers like a 40 square foot area. So it doesn't cover all that much. Um, so I just patched like the worst parts and then whatever, I'll skim it over and I'll get it in two or three years when we do it again. If it keeps, you know, it'll keep breaking down. I, I just want, I would just want a, just a half a tablespoon of your, 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 whatever you call it that getting outside and getting stuff done like yeah. just i just just a tiny bit you don't just need all that. that yeah you can you could spare you a little just bit. like hang around me you'll just like oh my God. You'll just catch no it's it. just gonna just make the... me tired i'm getting tired just listening to you yeah like i, I was like my whole saturday i and, oh man yeah. i just need that motivation i'd rather yeah. stay inside and play assassin's creed i i just so that there's you know you pull up into my house there's a gate and then the gate if you go into the gate you can kind of circle around to the back porch and the previous owners of the home had some slates there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I gotta replace this. I, I wanna replace them with like an actual walkway with like some gravel and some, you know, sure. uh, some stepping stones or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but at least I was like, let me go ahead and just like, at least pull up these slates because they're they're pretty well covered up. Oh, they're heavy. I, I did that this, I did that just on a whim yesterday when I was letting the dogs out to go to the bathroom. Uh, go to the bathroom, like it's a toilet out there. <laughs> Um, it's their bathroom. But uh, there was so much of that covered up with grass. These uh, things are like three times the size <laughs> I thought they were. 
So right now, all of these probably like seven or eight slates are just flipped upside down, <laughs> just sitting there. Mm. Because now like I pulled them out of a hole essentially. So now right. I'm like, well, dang it. Now I've got to like fill in these holes. Mm -hmm. I've got to just go like find dirt somewhere. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, you're speaking my language here. I don't like it. it sounds like a fun, I don't, like, I don't like project. this language at all. This is like the kind of project I would do after dinner. So, and like now that it's later out, I'd be like, yeah, let's go yeah. get dirty. Well, for the a lucky hours. thing is, like, the back half of my yard is just pine needles and crap. So I can just dig up some stuff over there yeah. and fill it in. Yeah, there's so. dirt. There's you, dirt. To, there's you dirt, have to dirt be had. elsewhere on your property. Yeah. <laughs> there's dirt to be had. <laughs> that's easy. <laughs> if all you need is dirt, that's an easy problem to solve. I mean, I should put you know, some sand or something there so they don't continue to sink down. But oh yeah. I'll do that well, later. Yeah. I don't I don't care for the slates particularly, but I'm mm -hmm. not gonna put them back in these giant you know, bury chasms. The... Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So yeah. Yeah. I've done that. If you want some advice, I can tell you. Well exactly I wanna do I wanna do the thing you did with your um you know, uh, brother-in-law, whomever's um, mm -hmm. trash thing. Put yeah. it put a nice landing for that because yeah. I'm just rolling it into dirt and I I'd, yeah. I'd like to have a nice area for the trash yeah. receptacle to fit. Yeah. But I don't actually want to do that. I just want it to be there. Mm, you just want it to be done. I know. Yeah. Well, so, and my list, my, my, my to-do list is growing, Brian. It's like half of my dry erase board now. Well, that's because you're not doing the things. I need to go and buy a bunch. <laughs> all the things need, I need to buy things for all of the things. Yes. And it's not expensive. Like caulk would be like four bucks. Like yeah. I just need to go get it, but I need to go get it. Yes. That's the fun part. You get to go to Home Depot. I don't want to. <laughs> you get to go shopping for, for toys. Oh, man. No, I hear I need I hear, to buy yeah. one of those stupid pole extender things so I change the halogens in my outside bowl. I don't want mm -hmm. one of those stupid poles. Yeah. I need to go to, oh. You have a ladder? You could just get up there and No, I'd need, I'd need like a 30-foot ladder to get up there. Oh. That's more expensive than a pole. I have a six-foot six ladder. That's fine. That's all I need. That's all I want. Yeah, if you got to go higher than that, you probably shouldn't be doing whatever it is up there. Agreed. It's going to, oh yeah. Agreed. I hear you. If I have a, if I have a taller ladder, that means I have to clean my own gutters, and I don't want to do that either. Well, mm -mm. That's, no, it's, don't it's, look at me like that. This, I mean, just these are all decisions you're making, which no, is see, perfectly see, fine. No, see, you you are like I I if if I have <laughs> the equipment, I can do more things. Me, I'm like I don't want the equipment so that I can't do all the things. <laughs> you want those barriers? Yes. There. Yeah. Absolutely. See me, I'm I'm very much the opposite yes. of that. I'm like, <laughs> let me look around and dream up a project so no. that I can then go buy the equipment oh my God. and then do the project. <laughs> and then I'll have too much equipment. Then I need to build a shed so that I can, but I have to clear the trees and then I can put the shed so that I can house the equipment <laughs> that I use to do the projects. I have a problem, oh. but you don't, you don't need to be me. You need to be on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, I did the driveway thing and that was, that was one thing. That's fine. Oh. I did, I did seriously debate about doing the ceiling myself. Cause after like squeegeeing out the, the, You're like, the oh, patch I can do stuff this. I've been this doing, I'm so like, bad. squeegeeing is not that hard. Like oh I really could do this, but I'm like, it's a lot of driveway and doing that by myself. Like that would really take a lot. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to have somebody do it. There are other more fun outdoor projects you could be doing in the meantime. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I need to be somewhat. There selective. are trees that need to be felled, Brian. There are trees that could be felled. What if yeah. they fall across the driveway, fun. Brian? I know. I know. I know. Could happen at any moment. I know. And I got a driveway ceiling company. We've used them. So like I can just do that. You let I them do I that. I don't have tree people lined up. That I'm going to take care of myself. There you go. Um, but what I did, I'm, I'm proud of myself, Drew. I used my little app to check my lawnmower. I knew the oil needed to be changed. Ah. So I changed the oil in the lawnmower and Here then we go. mowed the lawn. So yeah, but it's super dusty. We haven't had a lot of rain. No. It was just like- We get we get these little plume. hints of rain and I'm like, yay, rain. Yeah. Oh wait, no, it just- eh, It rained, just I think like, for one minute yeah. while I was mowing the lawn. At, and I was like, oh, oh, it's raining. Let me go park the lawnmower in. By the time I drove it over to the shed, it stopped. And Today on my like, lunch no. break, I went home ready to water the garden and yeah. I'm like, oh, I think it's going to rain. And I didn't. And mm. now I don't I don't think it did anything else. I think it was like a little like drip had, drip. had like these threats of thunderstorms and stuff. And that's nothing. Um, <sighs> so anyway, so I, so that was my my yes, my Monday. My, my I changed the lawnmower, mowed the lawn. And then, well, I washed two of our cars as well. Just Jeez, whatever. Brian. And then, no, the real fun part was I got to clean my grill. Oh. Because you, I'm sure you've had this happen. I... 
I had my parents over like last weekend or not this past weekend, but the one before. And I was like, I hadn't used the grill yet this, this year. And so I started to use it. And like literally the bottom of the grill is like on fire from all the grease and crap mm. that had fallen. And I was just like, well, I'll just kind of let that burn away. I was like, I'm going to give it a minute to kind of burn that off before I throw the food on there. And I was like, oh crap, there's, but there's this just caked on yeah. grease and other junk. And I was like, I really need to get in there. It took me two hours Jeez. of hardcore scrubbing oh, with man. brushes and all kinds of stuff. It got to the point where I got like, a scrub brush attachment thing that I kind of bought on a whim that goes onto like a drill. And it was like, I was in there like drilling and scrubbing cause it was just, I was so tired from just oh my scrubbing God. it by hand. It was just, it had been a couple of years since I'd really done a thorough cleaning of it. And it was, it was due. So Ooh, maybe I, I should do mine. I did all that. Yeah. Cause I've, I've had it happen before where I was cooking stuff and it actually like the grill caught fire and flames were like shooting out of the back. That's mm -hmm. why you're not supposed to have your grill too close to your house or mm -hmm. anything. Because if you don't clean your grill and it grease catches on fire, it can burn your house down. So yeah. at least I know that, but it got to the point where I was like, yep, yeah, I need to clean it. This is like a safety thing. Yeah. And I didn't want to do it. I was tired, but I was already gross from having to do like the lawn and all that other stuff. Yeah. And I was like, well, let's just get into it. And it took like two hours. I, I like, we, probably, we probably used, I probably grill about once a week actually. That's a pretty yeah, your grill probably needs to be cleaned. Yeah. We don't we don't do a lot of greasy things though. Okay. I will say we don't do a lot of burgers. Um, yeah, burgers are what really gets Yeah, the we don't on. we do a lot of chicken, um, a lot of uh mm. just, you know, grilled veggies and stuff like that. Yeah. Um veggies aren't aren't really a problem. It's the meat. It's the meat that uh, Well the veggies are always on foil anyway. So Yeah. Um but mm. yeah, usually usually chicken. Hot yeah. hot dogs every now and then. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely need to clean it, no doubt. Yeah. And um the the Webers come with this little disposable like trap. And oh, yeah. mice found that and destroyed it. So <gasps> right now I don't have a trap. But luckily Home Depot sells all Weber replacement things, which is why I bought a Weber because oh, I'm yeah. like, I know that I can very easily get replacement mm -hmm. yeah. everythings. Yeah. So no yep. reason to go to Home Depot. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like you just need to make a trip, Drew, and just get all the things I that do. you need in your life. Yeah. This weekend, it, it, we, we'll, get, we'll get paid on Friday, so I'll go this weekend. There you go. Sounds like fun. It'll be nice and hot. Yay. Clean your grill in the heat. Got to love it. <laughs> if the hose can't get it off, I ain't. Mm, I will right. say it was the one good thing about it is I was doing all this stuff and Rachel's inside playing Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. See, that's what that I want to be doing. doing. I know. That's what she was doing. She was living her best life in there. Oh. And she like comes outside and sees me like covered in filth, scrubbing down this grill after I've been mowing and everything. And she came out and she was like, I really appreciate you doing these unseen things. And I was like, that's awesome. That I'm is glad. cool. All I need is that like 20 seconds worth of validation. And that was enough to fuel me for like the whole rest of the thing. Cause it was disgusting <laughs> cleaning yeah. that out. And there's always like wasp nests and stuff they, they build in the grill. So I gotta like navigate all of that. And I'm like, okay, I gotta clear all the creatures that could be living in here. Mm -hmm. And then I gotta do, clean the grill. Do you remember that time you got a new grill and you gave me your old one? Yeah. So you came over to drop it off, but, and you had offered to dispose of my old grill, Yeah. but we couldn't, do you remember why? didn't like fall apart or something no like it had or... an active bird's nest in it oh a bird's nest. that's right yeah. and i was like well i guess just leave this one here I'll, i'm not grilling I'll now yeah. well no that was my old one but yeah. so i had two grills on my back porch the old busted one that was just a bird home a bird nest yeah <laughs> because bird, i'm like well house. i don't i don't i didn't want you taking it because i'm like well the birds are here and yeah. then they wouldn't the mom wouldn't be able to find them so i just it, it stayed on my back porch a small back porch yeah um for I, th I think until I moved out of the house. Wow. <laughs> um, because I, I just didn't, I didn't want to rent a, a vehicle to come get just a broken grill. So I, I waited until I had something else I needed to move. Yeah. So I think I, I waited until like I needed to get rid of an oven or something like that. So, okay. but yeah, yeah, critters, man. Oven shaped birdhouse. Yeah. That's probably funny. Pretty much. Oh, man. Cool. Well, that was it. That was my, that was my time. All right. Lots of chores. Well, that sounds exhausting. Yeah. It was fun. I'm getting good sun, though. How many times did you watch Severance? I have not watched it anymore. <gasps> My brother-in-law is though. I think he's up to episode seven. There we go. So he's getting there. I was like, oh yeah, you gotta, you gotta finish those last two episodes. Do you know when the It'll new, new season's coming out? No, the writer's strike. It's holding everything up. Oh man. Yeah, they're you like think they'd be almost production. done by now. Like just. No, you can't, can't rush perfection, Drew. But it hasn't been around for that long, has it? I mean, I feel like it's been around for a while. I don't know how long it's been out. Year, year and a half, two years maybe since hmm. they first. I mean, they yeah. were, they've been in production with it. They started production like right before COVID, 
And then the whole first season they filmed as COVID was oh, all unfolding, okay. which led to some of the ominous, you know, characteristics mm. of the show because they were all like quarantined and all that kind of stuff while they were filming it. Okay. So yeah, now they're. they're oh, we're two hundred five. That's not bad. Oh gosh, we really filled the time, haven't we? We did. <laughs> okay. But yeah, you know that's fine. Okay, I've uh, got a couple of quick company updates, and then we can wrap it up. All right, so I have a note here to mention the blog. I'm mentioning the blog, Drew. I think you added that in here. What are we mentioning about the blog? Just, Rachel, Rachel, just wanted, blog Rachel wanted us to mention the blog. We have a blog, y'all. Um, it will, the blogs have changed. Yeah. I will say, the blog has changed a lot. We used to post all kinds of random stuff. Before, like random updates. Before kind of, social media was basically the place where you got like, updates Hey, look, we things. got this new pen in. But. Yeah, we had, at, I think at our peak, we had something like 2,700 blog posts. We pared it down to, I think, 350 because yeah. there were so many that were like it's more of duplicated or just weren't relevant. Rachel has done a lot of work on it um, with the help of our customer care team and Adrian. Yeah. And it's more of a knowledge resource at this point. Yeah, than, it's more like articles than a blog. Right. Very, very informative. Very. Uh, it, yeah, I would just say it's a resource. Mm -hmm. It is definitely we're, we're treating it as an actual information hub like mm -hmm. a resource if, if, if a better name than blog existed we would probably just not even call it a blog anymore but it's we did a debate about that even just yeah. like, should we even call it a blog yeah we just didn't know if another name would stick so it's yeah. still a blog for now but um it's different so yeah i encourage you we'll we'll add a link below so um check it out it's definitely better more streamlined and it's going yeah. to be you know where we're going to have a lot of fountain pen 101 stuff as we continue to develop mm -hmm. that um but uh, if you haven't been there in a while it's definitely yeah, new and different and worth checking out. Posting a lot more ink reviews. We're taking a lot of the videos that we're doing and putting them more in written form for easier reference and stuff. So if you don't have the time for videos or you want something more as a quick reference, we have a lot of the a lot of the content over there too. So all good fun stuff to help you out. And then uh, the other update I have is that I'm going to be sitting out the pencast next week. I got some other stuff going on, but Adrian is going to be joining as a co-host. Uh, so Adrian sat in here and there a couple of times to answer some questions and stuff, but uh, we've never had yeah. another we, co-host We could have canceled it, but we're going to be canceling the following week, 4th of July week. Right. So we're like, well, I, we don't want to give, you know, the three people just that watch this, you know, you know, two weeks off. So right. uh, so we'll just give a couple of two-hour ones and then uh, throw Adrian in the deep there end. There you go. So um, she'll be sitting in next week. So I don't know what y'all are going to talk about, but whatever. Exactly. Have fun. Exactly. Have fun. That's what we'll talk about. All right. Um, now, yeah, if you have any Adrian specific questions, she's the manager of our customer care team. Um, throw yeah. them in the comments, you know, and we'll, uh, you know, ask her questions. Yeah. Like the most interesting item that's ever come back in a return. Or the most interesting packing alternative. Yes. Because people like to use tissues and things like that. And it's toilet almost, paper. Toilet paper, yeah. And you know that's not coming off a brand new roll. Actual popcorn. Real popcorn. Real popcorn. Yep. We've, we've had that before. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Entertaining. Well, mm -hmm. some people, you got to use what you got, right? Anyway. Um, Please don't. There we go. So that'll be happening. And uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this thing up. So I want to thank you all for watching. Leave us feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions in the comments and, and section on the video and whatnot. Um, and we can answer some more questions. If you have anything customer specific, Adrian will be here. Um, check out gulepens.com. We have the blog that we were just talking about. Lots of fountain pen ink, paper, pens, all that kind of stuff. And you can subscribe to our channels if you want to get more info. And my random fun fact. Hey. I pulled a lawnmower fun fact. A lawnmower fun fact. I'm mowing lawns. And you I and I worked mower on my lawnmower and, this week. Oh, okay. Is on my mind. Uh, so I was curious, like, how long has the lawnmower been around? Who invented the lawnmower? Joseph P. Lawnmower invented it in 1902. Wrong. So actually, the lawnmower was invented in 1830 by Edwin Beard Buddington of Stroud, Gloucester, England. Gloucester. Gloucester? Yeah. Gloucestershire is what it looks like. Oh, oh, oh. It's not Gloucester. No, that's not Gloucester. Gloucester, Gloucester Gloucestershire. I'm sure, I'm sure they say it with fewer syllables than that. <laughs> Gloucestershire. I think that's- Gloucestershire. 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 Let's, say, let's say Gloucestershire. Stroud, Gloucestershire, England. Whatever, whatever is happening Say the there. name again. Edwin Beard Buddington. Say it with a British accent. <laughs> I don't know how to do that without sounding like I'm making fun of the British accent. Edwin Beard Buddington. That's not bad. I've That's not bad. <laughs> I don't know if it sounds very proper. Here, now, now, now make Whatever. fun. Now do a you know mocking American accent to balance the scales. Uh, see, I feel like see you if can you go make fun, a lot of different you directions. Make, if you make fun of America and England, then it's it's it's. it's 
Fair. But then I'm making fun of like other Americans. Otherwise, I'm just using my own accent. I know. You're really just making fun of like Southern Americans whenever you- like, I feel like the Southern accent is the go-to like do. European it is. American accent, right? It is. Yeah. But you could have Boston. You could have Long Island. You could have all yeah. kinds of- Yeah. I guess the Southern things. one's just the easiest you for us have mid, to do because there are people around here that sound like that oh, sure. sometimes. But I think that's like globally, I would It I would is. Say. Yeah, you're right. I would say that's kind of a go-to American Yeah, it's like the, cow, the cowboy- yeah, a little bit, yeah. a little bit. All right, well, we'll leave that um, alone. We'll but anyway, on. so 1830, Edwin invented it. Um, it was designed primarily to cut the grass on sports grounds and extensive gardens as an alternative to the Sith. That's what they had before that. It's, you not, know. it's not Scythe? Scythe, is that how it's pronounced? Sith is like the bad guys from Star Wars. <laughs> oh, maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using the force to cut they the used grass. To use, they used to use Jedi before. Yeah. Before. <laughs> Scythe, yeah, or Sith? I think Sith, Siv. That's a different. Sieve, a Siv is like a filter. Siv is a yeah. It's like a yeah yeah. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. I lost my <laughs> accent. Um, and then the first motor-powered lawnmowers became commercially available around 1921. Have you ever used a manual lawnmower that you just pushed with the rolly, rolly dues? I've always wanted one of those. You can buy them. Yeah, I've seen them for sale. Yeah, that's, that's like the, making a comeback. That's your second home. It feels depot. like a, it feels like a millennial hipster type of thing to get into. Right? It does. It does. Yeah. I think it's better for the environment. You're not burning up gas. I feel like it'd make you. I almost work. went down that rabbit hole of like, because there was, as I was looking at lawnmowers for the fun facts, there was some stuff about like the pollution and stuff they provide. And I was like, this is, I don't want to go down this rabbit mm. hole. It's too depressing. But yeah, they're not great for the environment. I wonder how much more money Joseph could earn if he cut the grass with one of those. He'd be out know. there for like two days. He wouldn't be out. No, he wouldn't be out there for two days. He would be not, <laughs> not having it. He wouldn't be doing it. He'd be inside with Rachel. Oh, man. Oh, I forgot to mention the whole asphalt thing. Yeah. Ellie helped me with part of it. Of course she did. Yeah. Wow. Because she, we went, so we gave, I, for, I totally forgot about all this. Um, you know, the kids had a really good end of the year and their grades were good and stuff like that. So we, you know, we wanted to get them a special thing. So we gave them like a budget and went to Target and she wanted above what her budget was, but she hadn't earned it yet. So we were like, you know, we don't do this a lot, but it was like, okay, f for the kids, it's like, if you... If you want something and like either your money's at home or you, you know, have a little bit left to earn or whatever, it's like, we'll buy it and you'll get it once you yeah, earn the rest. I've done of that it. before. Like, I'm not just going to give yeah, it to you. Yeah, like, it's yeah. usually something he can do right when he gets home. Like, right. all right, you've got clothes to put away. Yeah. Go so home, put Ellie, away the clothes, and you can have the thing. Ellie was close. And I had like one more bag of like that asphalt stuff to spread. And so it was like, all right, Ellie, if you want to earn this right away, like, I'm going to go out and do this asphalt thing anyway. If you come and be my helper, then that'll that'll be that'll cover the rest. And she did it. She was out there squeegeeing and getting dirty and everything. And I was like, all right. There we go. That's my girl. Anyway. TCB Ellie. So there you go. That's it. The pencast this week. I will see you all in two weeks. Drew will see you next week. Or you won't see any. Actually you I guess no one will see you. You won't see You'll any see in us. two weeks. Because uh in for you two, it'll be three weeks. I'll yeah I'll I'll miss the next two weeks. Yes. But then I'll be back. Anyway, that's what we got. Thanks for watching and right on.